so they all skied away. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, this claims here that a uh, man with four documented broken ribs, two of which were separated broken, not just cracked, but separated. <coughs> four documented broken ribs said he was okay to two other ski patrollers that came, allegedly came by. Did that bother you at all? That's my understanding of what happened. Did it bother you that allegedly, see this uh, yellow over here? Uh, but a patroller came by to check on everyone. Did it, did it bother you that there was no log of that patroller? No. Didn't bother you? Okay. So nothing so far has bothered you, right? Okay. These are just the facts. That Every, everyday bother. life in, at your valley, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, now, did it bother you See this right here where my cursor is? Yes. That Eric Christensen, after this crash, uh, goes to lunch with one of the most famous actresses in the world and her family. Did that bother you at all? No, I think that's standard practice for ski instructors. Uh, did it bother you that three hours after lunch or so that he then writes his report? That bother you? Did that concern you at all? No, that's typical of what happens. Did it ever occur to you that this instructor might be covering up bad conduct by himself to protect Miss Paltrow, a big spender at Deer Valley? Did that ever concern you or bother you? No. Did it ever concern you or bother you that he might be covering up bad conduct by Gwyneth Paltrow? No. Uh, didn't you basically wink and a nod at this bad conduct? Wink and a nod at it. Can you define that? Do you know what wink and a nod means? No. <laughs> well, actually you do because we had a deposition on another case. But, but wink and a nod, as I'm using it, means... You see something wrong, but you just wink at it and go on and don't do anything about it. Isn't that what you did here today? Absolutely not. Okay. Uh, why wasn't this instructor terminated for filing a false report? That this is his report. There's nothing in it that's false. Isn't that true that you believe he wasn't fired because he did nothing wrong? He did nothing wrong. Correct. Okay. Uh, and there was no cover-up by Deer Valley, correct? Absolutely not. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sykes. yesterday. I think I just need to go back to the old technology again. Okay, so I just want to ask you, Mr. Graff, one question. Excuse me one second. I've got my computer. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I just want to ask you, Mr. Graff, a quick question about the patrol log. Um, published this we looked at it yesterday with you defendants exhibit 26 a you were asked questions not today but before you left the stand yesterday by plaintiff's counsel about this uh, bad boot uh, entry here do you see that I do see that 
and I, uh, um, do you remember questions about how that was sort of a, a, a minor issue and, and he was asking why that would be long but other major issues might not be? Yes. So can you explain what is a bad boot it, it, and what would it require of a patrol, uh, patroller who came upon that kind of a problem? You know, I'm not exactly sure what this bad boot issue was, but um, it could be that a buckle was broken. It could be that, as funny as it sounds, could be they were on the wrong feet. <laughs> you know, you see things like that. Um, so there was some issue that Jess responded to, and it was as simple as a bad boot. And might it require a toboggan down the hill if someone had a malfunction that they, they couldn't get down the hill? Yes. Okay, so, um, and then this, this section here, 1202, again, I'll use this little laser pointer, 1202 here, um, it, over in the nature of the injury discussion, it says here collision and disorientation. Do you know who wrote that? I don't know who wrote it. Um, whoever is manning the dispatch uh, is the person who, who puts these entries in. Okay, so would, would it be fair to say then that it would not be Whitney Smith that wrote that? It would not be Whitney Smith. They're transcribing what Whitney Smith is saying over the radio. So Whitney Smith was on scene two minutes after the call came in. Um, and then whoever was there wrote down what she said. Okay. And she said that she was on scene of a skier collision um, with a patient experiencing disorientation. Right, and and the jury has heard what her experience was, and you don't know anything further uh, than you've already told us about that, correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. No further questions. All right, you are excused. Thank you. Thank you. Is it there a possibility the witness may be called back? Not from us. Yeah, very small. Okay, so you're still under... Uh, I guess this trial, so please don't discuss the case with any of the other witnesses. Okay, thank, you. thank you. Mr. Owens, is your next witness ready? Yes, our, our next witness is Dr. Schur. We, we uh, will need an easel and to set up for him to draw, and we may need a second to do that. Just okay. 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 Go ahead and set up. Dr. Scher? Yes. Good morning. Come on forward here and be sworn in as a witness. Do you swear that the testimony you are about to give in the case now before the court will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Take a seat here and adjust your microphone and then please state your full name and spell it all out for us. Thank you. My name is Irving Schur, I-R-V-I-N-G. Last name is S-C-H-E-R. Thank you for being with us here today, Dr. Schur. Um, Let's, let's begin by just asking you what you understand your role here to be today. Uh, to teach the jury about biomechanical engineering related to snow sports and particular skiing. And uh, do you have uh, an understanding of what plaintiff's biomechanical expert Dr. Bame has said about this case? I have. I've read his uh, deposition testimony and his trial testimony. So I do understand what he's saying in the case, yes. Okay, and you have opinions about his testimony, is that right? That is correct. I have analyzed his uh, biomechanical engineering analysis. So the jury will get to hear your response to his analysis? Exactly. Okay, great. So before we get to that, let's talk about your background and training so they understand why uh, you and not me <laughs> are, are on the stand. Sure. Um, so uh, where did you go to school? I did my bachelor's of science and engineering at the University of Pennsylvania. I majored in mechanical engineering and applied mechanics. And then after undergrad, I moved west and I got my master's and my PhD at UC Berkeley in the mechanical engineering department. And I had two disciplines that I specialized in. 
One was called dynamic systems. That's how objects move in space when forces are applied to them. And the other is biomechanical engineering. And that is the application of physics and engineering to the human body, in particular, looking at how people get injured and how to prevent injuries. And did you do a PhD thesis? I did. And can you explain what you worked on? Sure. Um, I, I was uh, the last in a line of what we called skiologists. Um, I studied the biomechanics of alpine skiing. I uh, created load cells, so those are uh, devices that measure the forces, and I put them in between the skis and the bindings. And uh, I had different instrumentation on skiers, and it was the first time, or at least that I'm aware of, that we were, uh, anyone in the scientific community, was able to measure the forces and the body motions of skiers from the top of the mountain all the way down to the bottom. And I did this with beginners, people who had only skied two or three days in their whole life, uh, all the way up to professional racers. And so uh, that's what I got my PhD in. And this is actually measurements on the slope as people are skiing. That's right, exactly. Yeah, I'm measuring the forces applied to the person and their body motions as they're skiing well, and falling. We did have falls as well. Right, and so you, this is not just calculations in some ivory tower, but you're actually out in the field looking at Hands-on work, which is quite difficult when you have electronics and snow and water. It, it was challenging for sure. And do you also t do any teaching? Uh, I did teach. Um, after I graduated with my PhD, I did a, a small postdoc in the biology department at Berkeley. And then after that, uh, while I was working for a company, I taught at the University of Southern California. I was in the physical therapy department uh, on the medical campus, and I taught intro to biomechanics. And I also did research there at USC. And then um, I moved, uh, I now live in Seattle, and I'm at the University of Washington. I have an affiliate professorship there. I'm an associate, affiliate, associate professor at the University of Washington, and I occasionally lecture, but mostly advise grad students. What about uh, professional licenses? Do you have any of those? I'm a registered professional mechanical engineer in California, Washington, and Alaska. And then in terms of professional societies, these groups of people that uh, get together to research and work on a certain field, are you connected to any such uh, organizations? I am. And what are those? I am chair of a group called ASTM F27. If you've ever gone to a ski shop and uh, purchased ski equipment or rented uh, ski equipment and they set your bindings, what some people call DIN settings, um, that's based on the standards from ASTM and I'm uh, the chairman of that group. We also do other snow sports equipment. Um, I represent the U.S. for snow sports equipment safety uh, at the International Standards Organization, so the ISO. So if uh, you go over to Europe, you'll have the same uh, release and retention settings for your skis. Your, your bindings won't pull off your skis. They use the same standards that we've developed here in the U.S. Um, I'm also president of a group called the International Society for Snow Sport Safety, and that's um, more academic than the other two organizations I was mentioning. Uh, we call it IFSS. IFSS is the premier organization worldwide to present and publish your snow sport safety research. Um, and we have members from uh, all over the world, Switzerland, Korea, Norway, obviously the US, uh, Canada, Australia. New Zealand. Um, it's, uh, it's quite a great group and it's really the group that helped develop uh, ski binding standards. So you do some research uh, on um, uh, the safety of s snow sports like skiing, correct? That is my main focus of my research ever since grad school and I've continued to do that now. And then you, you also evaluate cases in a, a litigation context, is that right? I do. About 15%, 20% of my work is uh, forensic work. The rest is research and development. So most of the time, uh, are you doing research to, to try and 
uh, improve the safety of skiers on the hill? Yes, uh, and I should say it's not just snow sports. I work in other recreational sports areas, water sports, mountain biking, uh, other areas too, but snow sports is my, my favorite, my passion. So let's explain to the jury what bio, biomechanical engineering is, just because sure. we could use a refresher. Sure. Biomechanical engineering is the application of physics and mechanical engineering to the human body. But in a forensic sense, um, it's what links the event to the injury. So if you have some type of event and there's forces and motions in the event, in the accident, the forces are applied to a person, there's internal forces on their, like in their body at the joints or something like that. The amount of force and the amount of motion it takes to create damage to the body, that is biomechanical engineering. And how is that different than medicine? They're both dealing with the human body, but what's the difference? <clears throat> sure. The medical field tends to uh, take the injured person, figure out what's wrong with them, so diagnosis, and then try to get them better, so treatment. Uh, with an eventual outcome. So um, most medical training is after the injury as opposed to what forces and motions create the injury. We like to think of ourselves on different sides of the injury. Thank you. Can biomechanical engineers determine the forces required to produce fractures of bones in the body? Yes, um, there's a lot of research on that and that's one of the main areas for biomechanical engineering. So is there scientific literature that describes the forces needed for, say, rib fractures? There is, yes. yes. And you're familiar with that literature? I am, yes. And uh, let's, let's maybe ask a specific question about that literature. Given your knowledge of it, does a 70-year-old man need to fall on his side uh, with his elbow between him and the ground to cause rib fractures? No, so there have been a number of scientific studies, mostly done by biomechanical engineers, but there's other scientists who have looked at this as well. And what they do is they take cadavers or portions of cadavers and they apply forces to them. Um, sometimes they'll swing a pendulum into the side of a cadaver or to the front, um, or they'll have a plate, a very heavy weighted plate, uh, contact the person arm down, arm up at 45 degrees. Um, or they'll drop the cadaver in different configurations, and then they'll see what injuries are produced. And so um, when they've done this, in particular for uh, chest impacts, what we find is you can get lateral rib fractures, according to the biomechanical engineering literature, you can get lateral rib fractures with a, an impact to the side with your arm down or with your arm up, but you can also get lateral rib fractures from compression. So front to back compression of the chest. So if I press my chest in like this, what happens is the ribs actually bend out on the side and that can create fractures on the side and that's quite common as well. So rib fractures are not just from side contact, it can be from front to back compression as well. So um, let's get to um, what you did in this case. So what did I ask you to do in this case? Uh, basically, you asked me to evaluate Dr. Baim's biomechanical engineering analysis to see if it was accurate and correct. And what ma material did you review? I think you already mentioned you read his transcript and you watched his trial testimony. Is that I right? Did. I did, yes. And maybe for the jury, in case they need a reminder, he had that green screen in the back of him. Right, just the talking head. He's exactly. speaking from Florida, I think. That's right. All right. And so let's uh, just start with his analysis. Do you agree with it? I do not. I do and, not agree with his analysis. And maybe uh, before we explain why, just give us a sense of what you, what you understand his method and analysis to be. Sure. Um, as I've gone through what he testified to in his deposition, in the trial, looking at his calculations and what he's done, to me there's two parts to his analysis. The first is calculations to show that Miss Paltrow had to land on Mr. Sanderson in order to get the rib fractures that he got. And then there was a second part that basically said um, because Miss Paltrow had to land on Miss Mr. Sanderson, that could only happen with Miss Paltrow 
hitting him from behind. It couldn't happen any other way. It was impossible. So that's my understanding of the, the kind of the two parts, the main parts. Thank you. We'll go in those we'll go over those in more detail. As you looked at his analysis, you read everything that he read, correct? I did. And did you read even more than that? Uh, I had additional depositions, that's correct. Of the various people that were at the scene of the accident? That's right. Um, so let's get one thing out of the way. Do, do you agree with Dr. Bain that Mr. Sanderson's rib fractures did not occur during the initial skier to skier contact? Yes, I, I think that that's correct. There's no disagreement at this point, at least from the testimony <coughs> I've heard. Um, the skier skier portion where they first contact, no matter which version we have, um, did not create the rib fractures. I don't think anyone thinks that at this point. So that's good. We, we agree. And um, in terms of just a, a quick overview before we go into uh, his calculations, which you can explain to the jury, do you believe that Miss Paltrow's account, and, and I should say, are you familiar with her account? I am. And you heard her trial testimony? I did. And read her deposition? And yes. do, you, do you believe her account of the collision uh, is consistent with what you know about biomechanical engineering? Object goes beyond the scope of this expert witness. They call for the evaluation. Go to your testimony. Would, would you please approach the bench? <clears throat> Okay, so let's go back to that question. I was asking you, in your opinion, is Ms. Paltrow's account consistent with what you know about biomechanical engineering? Yes, it is. And maybe another way to put that um, is, is it consistent with the laws of physics? It's the same question, yes. Yeah, and exactly. Dr. Baim, the jury heard, talked a lot about Newton's laws and the laws of physics, applying those to the evidence in this case. And again, in your analysis, as you apply them, Ms. Paltrow's um, uh, account is consistent with those. Objection lies foundation. Overruled? That's correct. Her, Ms. Paltrow's version, her, her scenario, is consistent with the laws of physics and what we know about biomechanics. And then th the account that Dr. Baim gave and that is uh, based on Mr. Ramon's account, um, is that consistent with the laws of physics? I do not believe it is, and I can explain as we get into it. Yes. Okay. Great. We'll we'll explain that. Let's let's um, go to Dr. Baim's calculations, so you can explain to the jury um, your analysis of those. I'm. We can. Ha we have an easel, and as I understand it, you you would like to kind of draw so that you can show them what the equations mean. Is that correct? That's exactly right. Okay, so I'll grab the easel and then that board. Now, uh, we can't walk 
the judge. Judge, where do you want to see the screen? screen? He's going to also need to see the screen. So oh, is yes. it OK if we put it right here? Are you going to be able to see that? I can't see it, but it's really more important that the jury see it. So I'm fine with that. OK. And, and I think uh, I'll. If it's yeah, okay with the judge, you you can get off the stand and, yeah. sure. and there's your marker. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. Okay, so I'm gonna pull up something that Dr. Bain pulled up uh, in his deposition. Do you remember seeing these documents? And for the record, and for counsel, these are um, the notes in Exhibit Three of Dr. Bain's deposition. Oh, thank you, your uh, oh, officer. Sorry, I, I missed the question there. Yeah, no, you're fine. So I'm just pointing but you to for you. Uh, what, these are not admitted exhibits, though. Yeah, I'm not asking them to be admitted. They were just shown in Dr. Bain's deposition, so we're showing them here as well. Okay, but not in his trial testimony. He's responding to these. You said deposition. He also showed it in his trial testimony. So oh, trial deposition. Yeah. No, I was, was going to say direct things to the judge, but I, I recall I recall this being flashed uh, during strong. his deposition or during his trial testimony. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sure. So you recognize this page? I, I do. And I was just describing it. This was shown in Dr. Bame's trial testimony, correct? That's correct. And he explained that these are his calculations? That's right. OK. And there's another page as well. I think it's the one just before it, correct? That's correct. This is where he starts the calculations for the ribs. We're concentrating on the ribs here, because that's what he says determines how the, the accident happened. He said the head injury doesn't matter for that. It's only the ribs. OK, great. So since I have very little idea what's going on there, and you do maybe explain to the jury what's going on. Sure. Can we go to the page before this? Sure. And maybe if you, it's just a little oh. bit hard to hear. Sorry, is that better? Yeah, that's okay. a little better. Yeah, thanks. Um, so he's using some um, basic equations for what we call the center of mass to figure out what happens when someone falls to the ground. Uh, center of mass is if you were to balance someone on, on your finger, the point that you'd hold them at so that they stay balanced. Um, it's usually a little bit um, below your belly button, kind of midline, front to back, midline, left to right. Um, and so if you took the person's, all the person's weight, all the person's mass, and put it into one point, that would be the point that you're interested in. So that's what Dr. Bame is doing in these calculations, is he's using that point for Mr. Sanderson. And this first part here, where he has this, um, that's an equation x is position. So he's saying there's a certain distance that center of mass falls. And you can see that over here. That's 3 and a half feet, or he does it in meters, 1.0668 meters. So center of mass falls to the ground. He's saying that there is no initial falling position, that, that's fine. No initial falling velocity, V is velocity. And then he has 1 half acceleration times time squared. And that equation is correct. Acceleration here is the acceleration from gravity. So what he's saying is Mr. Sanderson's fall to the ground for the center of mass from 3 and a half feet, which is probably about right, hits the ground within, and he calculates the time, he solves for time. 0.466 seconds. So that's the first part of that, which is great. The problem comes in that he then says the velocity at contact is one half acceleration times time. And that is absolutely wrong. That is not the velocity at contact. The velocity at contact is just the acceleration times time. So he has this extra half. And it was unclear to me why that would be there to start. And I'm not sure why he put that in. But it creates problems for his calculations and his opinions moving forward. If we can go to the next page, I can explain that. So 
these are his equations. If you remember in his testimony, he said 4,000 newtons. Yeah, that's a, an engineering unit in, in metric for force. 4,000 newtons is roughly 950 pounds, I, I think, in English. But newtons is fine. Over 4,000 newtons, you get the rib fractures. So what is this equation here? Uh, I'll show you that and then explain why that one half makes a, a big difference. So that equation there comes from, at first, kinetic energy. We label that as Ke, which is equal to one half mass times velocity squared for that center of mass. And then he's saying, OK, Mr. Sanderson, as he hits the ground, has a certain kinetic energy. That energy has to go somewhere. So what happens is a force is applied from the ground to his center of mass, and he decelerates over some distance. So you can see here he has three inches written here. That, that's important. So this kinetic energy has to be taken up by some force over a distance. That's some amount of work. And that will equal the kinetic energy. And then he divides both sides to get the force. The distances cancel on this side. So the force on Mr. Sanderson is 1 half mass times velocity squared divided by distance. And that's exactly what we have here. We have 1 half mass, velocity squared, and distance. Now, remember, he's doing this in metric. So that 136, that is in kilograms. That's equal to about 300 pounds. So here, he has Miss Paltrow and Mr. Sanderson's mass put together. So in this fall, he's saying, OK, the kinetic energy of both of them is needed here during contact. But can we go back to page five? Um, he uses the velocity here, the 2.29. That has the 1 half in this. So if we go to the next page, yeah. So you can see he's using the wrong velocity. What happens is if you use the wrong velocity in here, let's do BAMES as, call this wrong. So what you get is 1 half mass times 1 half acceleration times time. Oops, that's weird. There we go. Divided by distance. And squared there. Uh, correct is 1 half mass. acceleration times time squared. So that 1 half goes into this equation. What does that mean? That means that this half gets squared. It becomes 1 fourth. So the force that Dr. Bame calculated for this landing was actually 1 fourth of the force he should have calculated. He was off by a factor of 4. So it shouldn't be 4,600. And 80 newtons, it should be 18,600 and some newtons. Actually, I have it here. Um, 18,678 newtons. So he, he's off by quite a bit. And if I may, Dr. Scher, what, what this is obviously all uh, uh, at least new to me and maybe new to some jurors. What in the end uh, is, is the takeaway there if there's that much of a mistake? So there's there's two things. One is if there were 18,000 newtons applied to Mr. Sanderson's chest, we would expect much worse injuries. The biomechanical engineering literature for much less than that has many more rib fractures, internal injuries, all sorts of things. We don't see any of that for Mr. Sanderson. But the real takeaway and, and the importance in this case is the mass here. So because he does the one quarter, he needs the mass he needs the mass to be 136 kilograms. Now, if you redo the calculations correctly with, with just Mr. Sanderson's mass, so Mr. Sanderson is about 80 and a half kilograms, or roughly 177 pounds, at least according to 
the medical records, if you do the calculations with the correct equations and only his mass, you get over 4,000 newtons when he lands, actually. You get 11,056 newtons. So if he were to fall to the snow using Dr. Bame's calculation method the correct way, then just Mr. Sanderson falling, not Ms. Paltrow involved at all, he could get rib fractures. This is not quite correct overall. Normally we use what's called effective mass. So all of Mr. Sanderson's mass wouldn't go through his chest. Maybe there'd be some force on his legs. If he hit his head, some force on his head. We typically would say maybe 50% of his mass would be appropriate for effective mass. So instead of the 80 kilograms, we would do, and actually I should put over here, this winds up being 11,000 newtons. And if we do the 40 kilograms instead for Mr. Sanderson, so, um, and that's, uh, and we use the correct equation, we get Sorry, I don't do the math in my head. Um, 5,000, 500 newtons, uh, approximately. What this means is Mr. Sanderson can fall to the ground without Miss Paltrow landing on him and sustain the rib fractures according to Dr. Bame's calculation method. So if done correctly, he cannot say his opinion that Miss Paltrow had to land on Mr. Sanderson to get the rib fractures, which means that this goes through the rest of his analysis. So the rest of his analysis is wrong. So this is really critical, that one half that, that he did for the velocity, the, the wrong velocity, really threw the rest of his analysis into question. So Dr. Schur, there's a lot more we could say about the calculations, I'm sure. And you would, you would approach it differently than he did, correct? That, that's correct. But Given the way he did it, if he did it correctly, you're saying that the, um, the, the conclusions that he came to are inconsistent with his opinion? That's correct. Yes, okay. Exactly. exactly. OK, so um, yeah. Sure. OK, doctor, let's talk about um, let's talk about skier skier collisions. You've, as you explained earlier, done some research to understand what forces are like on the ski slope. Um, so um, in this case, how, how would you apply what you know about physics to understand the, the claims about the ski collision? Uh, sure, I would apply Newton's laws to um, the contacts, the different versions of the events, and see um, what makes sense, how it would unfold, do the physics of the contact that's being uh, testified to make sense? Is it self-consistent? And uh, this, this may be a, another opportunity to, to draw some pictures if you need to, so feel free to if it will help you. But um, you were talking about the center of mass earlier. How does that concept factor into how you would evaluate the evidence in this case? Uh, sure. Yeah, if it's OK to draw again. You may. Thank you. And I can see what you're drawing. Oh, nice. Perfect. Oh, great. And if you need more uh, board or pages, we have them now. Is that correct? I think we're OK with this, right? OK, yeah, great. Go ahead. So um, the thing to know with Newton's laws, force equals mass times acceleration, if you have some, and I'm going to draw two versions of a skier, and I'm not the best Pictionary player. Um, I'm going to draw a top-down version, and I'll draw a side version. So let's start with the top-down. So if we have a skier, and here's the skier's head, and here's the skier's nose, um, and then we have two skis. The center of mass would be, as we mentioned, looking down somewhere around here. Now, if you have a force that goes through the center of mass, so let's say the force goes through, 
then the person will accelerate in this direction. They'll accelerate along the line of the force. But what happens when you have a force that doesn't <coughs> go through the center of mass, it'll create an acceleration going in that same direction, but it'll also there's a distance here. It'll also create a torque, which is equal to the force times the distance, that will cause the person to rotate. And that's really important because if the force does not go through the center of mass, there's always a rotation. So if, if you're hit on the, this looking down, this would be the right side, then the person's going to rotate counterclockwise in this image. The same thing is true if we look at a skier from the side. So if here we have our skier, and here's their pelvis, and center of mass, boot, um, and if the person, for example, has a force applied below their center of mass, then there's, again, some distance. That's going to create a torque and a backward rotation so that the person moves backward and falls back. Um, there's two things to note with this for skiing in particular that's different than most other events. Skis have releasable bindings. So if I'm looking at this side view, the boot is held in by a heel piece and a toe piece. And so if you have someone pitching forward, if the ski slows and the person's center of mass moves forward, it'll create a torque on the boot and it'll release heel of the boot. And for someone of Miss Paltrow's size, that could be um, anywhere from, well, it's approximately 143 foot pounds. So 143 pounds acting over a foot. Um, same thing is true for the top down view. Uh, if we look at the toe piece for the binding, if there's a torque on, on the ski, a twisting torque, um, the ski will also release from the boot. And for someone of Miss Paltrow's size, it's about 37 foot pounds. So uh, in front of the boot, if there's 37 pounds one foot ahead, it, it'll release. If it's two feet ahead, it's uh, half that value. So um, roughly 17. So these are the principles that we need to understand the mechanics of an impact in a fall. So when we apply those principles to this case, what conclusions do you draw? Sure. The first is that Miss Paltrow's version of events is consistent with the, the laws of physics and how people move and rotate. And uh, what about Mr. Ramon's version? For Mr. Ramon's version, I couldn't get it to work. Um, it, there's, it doesn't match with the laws of physics. The, the complete part of his testimony just doesn't fit. And so can you explain why it doesn't fit? Uh, sure. So uh, Mr. Ramon's version, oh, maybe I should sit down. Oh, sure. Yeah. Go ahead. So uh, in Mr. Ramon's version, he says that he sees Miss Paltrow contact um, Mr. Sanderson squarely in the back. And he says that um, it's in the middle. It couldn't be any more in the middle than if he tried or if she tried. And then also that she rode him down. I think the quote was something like um, in his deposition, he says, like uh, she wouldn't, couldn't have been on his back any more than if he had strapped her to his back, something like that. So as they're going down in Mr. Ramon's version, uh, Mr. Sanderson goes spread eagle, um, arms out, legs out. Uh, and the key for me is that Mr. Sander, I'm sorry, Mr. Ramon says that the inside edges of those skis that are going into this V catch and Mr. Sanderson stops on a dime. 
And if that were the case, then Miss Paltrow would keep moving and, well, maybe I should draw. Sure, some of go those. ahead if it will. Yeah, I think so. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna try to draw a top-down version of this. So if we have Mr. Sanderson and here are his skis. And then uh, I'm going to use a different color for Miss Paltrow. How about blue? Miss Paltrow contacts him from the back. Um, and now this is the same whether one ski is between his or, or both skis. Um, it, if the skis are apart, it's a little bit different, so we can get to that in a minute. But if, if her skis are between his, let's just say, then when he falls, and here is his, so they're moving in this direction. That was probably obvious, but I wanted to make sure that was clear. So. Now we're, we're still looking down. Here's Mr. Sanderson's back. Here's his head. Here's one arm. Here's another arm. Here's one leg, the other leg. Now, remember Mr. Ramon says that his skis are in a V, spread eagle. So now if that were to happen, then he stops very quickly and Miss Paltrow is going to remain at, in contact somewhere around here, and her skis are going to stay underneath Mr. Sanderson. When that happens, it's like the center of mass continuing to move forward while the skis slow rapidly, which creates an upward force of that heel. It's going to create a heel release, but as you heard in the testimony, all the skis were on. It doesn't work. It takes actually very little force for this to release, the heel piece to release in a scenario like this. So it doesn't match with physics. And it's the same way whether one ski or both skis are in between. OK, so how do you know this, especially about the bindings releasing? How are you confident about that? Um, my, my experience, I mean, I've seen tons of binding releases. I know how bindings work. Um, it's uh, it's just physics, right? And you've specifically done research on binding releasing. Oh yes, yes. And and uh, you said earlier that there were other scenarios. The skis maybe between Mr. Sanderson's skis, maybe they're diagonal. Did you do evaluation of all those sort of scenarios? And did any of those work? No, I couldn't get any of them to work. So. Um, the, the key is either she would come out of the bindings or she would be stuck on Mr. Sanderson. Um, she wouldn't be able to move past him. If her skis stayed on in various versions of this, uh, I don't know how she continues to move downhill the 10 feet that Mr. Ramon said she wound up if her skis are trapped underneath him. And would you expect her to get an injury in any of these scenarios? Well, certainly um, there's that potential, yes, a lower extremity injury for sure. If, if, for example, her legs get stuck in one of the scenarios you mentioned. Right. So, for example, if her ski is rotated out to the side going in that V with one of his skis, the other, whether it's on the outside or in the inside, can't wind up. Um, well, so if her ski is on the outside, his ski is going to push her ski out. Um, if, if this is her ski. As he's, as he's falling and moving into that V configuration, it's going to go from this position to here, and it's going to push her ski outward, um, which I would expect would create a toe release, um, a twisting release of the bindings, because it actually takes about 18 pounds of force between 15 and 20, depending on how her bindings would be set. So very little force to release that toe piece. But even if it didn't release, then her ski winds up getting trapped by his, and she can't move for, forward. So, um, and in many of these scenarios, 
her leg would get twisted in a really odd way that would likely create injuries. Okay, great. I think you can sit down again. And now what I'd like to do is ask you about uh, whether you were involved in creating any animations that would help the jury understand your opinions in this case. Yes. And, uh, Your Honor, if I may ask for permission to show the witness uh, these animations so that he, I can lay some foundation, he can use them to sure. teach the jury. Uh, we reserve our same objections on these animations, Your Honor. Understood. Recess while they straighten out the technology, and then we'll be back.
Okay. All right. Why don't you go ahead and have the jury come in? Dr. Sherry, you can take the stand. We're just waiting for the jury. Are you on? Uh, yes. Yeah, she's monitoring uh, the oh, audio. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Egan. You may proceed. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. May I approach to show the witness the animation? You may. So this animation is number five, correct? It is. It's called Close Up. And I'm going to play it for you. Is this one of the animations that you helped prepare? Oh, sorry, Counselor. I didn't, I didn't see the name. Sure. Which number is it? Number five. It's called Close Up. And it's 22 seconds. So again, Mr. Schur, uh, Dr. Schur, your, um, uh, maybe explain to the jury your involvement in creating this animation. Uh, sure. I worked with uh, Brian Brill at Mountain Graphics on the uh, impact and fall portion of this animation. It's not meant to represent exactly what happened, but generally the idea of one of the 
uh, family of ways this could happen in Miss Paltrow's version. Um, we don't know some of the exact details of how they contacted, how long they interacted, but it gives an illustration of uh, what, it, what I'm thinking, my understanding of her version where they contact, she's contacted from behind, and then fall to the right. Um, and the, yeah. and does the animation make certain assumptions about various facts um, and testimony in the record in this case? Yes, it does. Okay, and you can explain those to the jury as we go through it. Uh, sure, yeah. And the animation will help you explain what you said earlier about biomechanics, applying biomechanics to this case. Right, exactly. Okay, so permission to publish this to the jury, Your Honor? Uh, just uh, we assert our ongoing objection to the animations or cartoons. They uh, lack foundation, uh, distort re the reality, and are incomplete. So animation number five is received for demonstrative purposes only to help this witness uh, explain his testimony. Thank you, Your Honor. So Dr. Scher, I'm going to let you take the reins here and use it as you need to explain, okay? Thank you. Is that all right. Uh, can we? Oh, Your Honor, we also object to the extent that this witness ha hasn't testified to any of in the placement of any of the other skiers or or bodies in this animation. Mr. Egan, uh, is that relevant to this witness's testimony? The other skiers? No, he's going to talk about the collision itself. So you should ignore any of the other skiers that are shown in the animation. Okay, so you can reverse it, Dr. Schur, to just uh, before the collision, so you can, we can focus on that and explain what you mean um, to show by this animation. Maybe I can't. How do you... <laughs> you could press play again, and it will get to it. Oh, here we go. Okay, there you go. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. So take us through, um, if you would, Dr. Schur, what uh, um, this animation shows from your point of view as a biomechanics expert. Sure. Um, the first thing that you should be aware of is that this is Miss Paltrow's version of the events. So Dr. Schur, sorry to interrupt you. Oh. Just maybe pull your mic. Sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, the, the first thing to be aware of is um, this is Miss Paltrow's uh, version of the events. So that's what we're showing here. And um, as we move forward, I'll talk about the physics, kind of like what I drew earlier with the center of mass and the rotation, and that's the idea, that's what went into this. But again, this is not exactly what happened, this is just one of the possible ways it could have happened. So um, we have Miss Paltrow in black, Mr. Sanderson in the blue, as uh, they move forward in time. Uh, it's uh, her testimony that his skis slid between hers. Mm -hmm. There we go. Uh, she felt a contact directly in the back, along her back. It sounded like her buttocks as well. Um, it, the person was grunting, um, pressing against her, but they were on their skis for a period of time. If in this situation he's also moving to skiers right, which is in the left in this image, that will create, remember I had the force that was offset from the center of mass. That's going to create a rightward motion for her, but also create some initial rotation. Now, in, in this portion, there's a number of possibilities. She could be adding weight to her right ski because of the contact from Mr. Sanderson. Um, when you ski, if you're in, let's just take a snowplow or what my kids call pizza position. If you weight the right ski, you turn left. So if she weights the, the right ski here more because of the contact, she's going to turn counterclockwise. The contact from Mr. Sanderson, if it's more to the right, will turn her counterclockwise. So as they're moving to the right here, there would be some counterclockwise rotation and here her ski can catch or she could 
pitch to the side or they could both pitch to the side they could both lose balance we're not sure what happens but as they're rotating they're continuing to fall and Miss Sanderson um, Miss Paltrow's version has them spooning uh, essentially as they're coming down together which would make sense if their legs got caught up if he was contacting her below her center of mass where his right leg was contacting her right leg her uh, thigh in that area also consistent with Miss Paltrow saying that her knee, her right knee was splayed open at the end and she felt right knee discomfort, that, that all could happen there. So as she's rotating and he's rotating counterclockwise, they fall to the side. Now, at this point here in the animation, I guess maybe the next frame, if I can do it. Mr. Sanderson lands on his right side, maybe the right back. Um, it's hard, hard to say. If he lands on his right side, kind of like Dr. Bam said, you know, he needs to land on the elbow, that can happen. That can create lateral rib fractures. But that's not the only way. His arm could be out, he could land on the side and create lateral rib fractures. He could land on his side and a little bit towards the back and Miss Paltrow could land on him. She could be fully on him, maybe um, with her, her buttocks or her back or some portion of her mass compresses his chest front to back, and that can create his rib fractures. There's a lot of different ways this could happen. I can't tell which one of those is right, but all of those are consistent with her version of the events. As they hit the snow, they would continue to move forward until friction slows them down. And uh, it's also important to note, we haven't talked about the head injury, but hitting the back of the head or the side of the head, he could have his head turned. All of those are possibilities for him to contact his head on the snow. So that's not inconsistent as well. Would it be helpful to show it in real time? You've been doing it kind of slow motion, which sure. has been also been very helpful. Maybe, maybe start from the beginning and just play it. Objection lacks foundation for Trajectory, speed, and direction. Overruled, it's a demonstrative of this witness's testimony only. All right, thank you. Okay, and this and, is... Sorry, yeah, go ahead, Dr. Schultz. This is from the, the beginning. And if there's anything you want to comment on as it happens, feel free. I think that accurately reflects the version that Miss Paltrow testified to that matches the laws of physics and biomechanics as I understand them. And would it be helpful to show, there's one other animation that has a little zoom in from the other angle, would that also be helpful? I think, it, yeah, it can't okay. hurt. Let's show that then, permission to approach your honor for that. Okay. What's the number of this animation? This will be number it's called zoomed in side. Who was the last one, James? Five. Number five. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Wait just a sec. Okay, Dr. Sure. So I'm playing you number four, the zoomed in from the side version. Were you a part of creating this version as well? Yes, this is the same animation, but from a different camera view. Got it. And will this animation also help you explain the same things you've been going over it, with the jury? It's the same thing, sure. Yeah, I, I think it also visualizes, it, it illustrates my opinion. Okay. Your Honor, permission to show this uh, animation? Subject to the same objections by the plaintiffs, the animation for zoomed inside is received for demonstrative purposes only. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. So, Dr. Scherer, maybe since we've already gone through this, this slow motion, let's just play this one from the start, and then you can add anything that you can provide to the jury from this angle. Sure. Here. Let's play first and then, there we go. Um, I'll wait 
until the contact point. coming up here we go there's contact fall to the right this one doesn't show the rotation quite as much and we don't know the amount of counterclockwise rotation as well there could be a little there could be more or less right we're not sure but if you if you go backwards a little bit uh, in into the moment of the collision this one maybe shows uh, does this one show the skis coming between the skis Yes, it does, and I think it's better visualized in this one. Yeah, and and again, uh, what's the significance of that in terms of how the mechanism of the fall occurs? Well, um, that's Miss Paltrow's testimony, and it works for the physics of them falling and rotating slightly counterclockwise. Um, frankly, if it wasn't both skis, if it was one ski between hers, the kinematics would be the same. For example, if his right ski were on the outside of her right ski, it wouldn't change the general kinematics. This is generally, and I keep saying generally because we don't know the exact details of it, uh, this would work. So if we flipped the, the positions of the parties and Mr. Sanderson was in front, Ms. Paltrow came from behind, using this uh, as a good visual for the jury, we explain the, your opinions about what we, we would expect to happen um, on Mr. Ramon's account, I should say. Well, Mr. Ramon's account is very different because in Mr. Ramon's account, uh, Mr. Sanderson goes spread eagle and his skis go out into that V and the inside edges catch. And that changes the kinematics, the motion. Um, it's a very different version of what happens with the contact. And uh, in terms of... Uh, I guess we've covered that. So maybe we'll wrap up here. The um, you've covered a lot of things, a lot of new things, perhaps for members of the jury and uh, those of us in the room. Will you um, will you uh, summarize for us um, what are, what are the main points that you want to get across for the jury here? Uh, sure. The first is that Dr. Baim cannot say with any accuracy that Miss Paltrow landed on Mr. Sanderson. His calculations are wrong and when you look at the equations done properly, Mr. Sanderson can land on the snow and sustain his injuries without Miss Paltrow fall falling on him. And if I may, Dr. Schur, was it your understanding that Dr. Baim's opinion was that his account was the only possible way the injuries could occur. Yes, Mr. Ramon's version was the only possible way. He said Ms. Paltrow's was impossible, which I believe is false. I, I think Ms. Paltrow's version is possible. Right, and would you say that Ms. Paltrow's is the more likely of the two accounts? Well, considering it's the only one that matches with the physics of what would happen in contact, yes, I think so. Okay, and I interrupted you. You were going through the, your main points. What was the next one? Well, I think we've covered it. The, the second thing is that Dr. Baim cannot say that Miss Paltrow's version is impossible. That's absolutely wrong. It sounds like you're saying, in contrast to Dr. Baim, that there are various ways this uh, accident could have happened, the injuries could have uh, occurred for Mr. Sanderson. Is that right? That's correct. And um, you've evaluated the various testimony, correct? I have. And you've, you've uh, done a careful analysis from a biomechanical engineer's perspective on what different scenarios might be likely or how they would happen, correct? Correct. And, and is it your opinion that Ms. Paltrow's version is the more likely of the two versions that you looked at, Mr. Ramon's and Ms. Paltrow? Yes. Once again, it's the only version out of the two that matches with the laws of physics, the, the biomechanics of it. Okay. Anything else you'd like to tell the jury that maybe I, I interrupted you on and you, you missed out on? No, I think we're, we're good. Okay, thank you. And that's thank all you. for now, Your Honor. Can you keep the screen there? Um, sure. You can turn it off. Well, actually, leave it on for right now. On or off? On. Okay. Uh, okay. Doctor Sure. Sure, that works. Sure, Doctor Sure. Okay. Um, this version right here. Can you 
back it up about to here on the scroll? To here? Yeah, and then go forward it out halfway between the last one. Okay, a little farther. Just before when we when uh, Mr. Sanderson, who was also uh, maybe it's easier if you do. Well, could you just go a little bit farther forward? Just go slow. I just want to get Mr. Sanderson, who sometimes is called Dr. Sanderson. Mr. Jerry, would you mind putting on the remote that allows you to be picked up? Okay, how about this? Sure. Okay, uh, go a little farther forward, please. Okay, and then when we get, okay. Now, this is uh, Terry Sanderson. That's Mr. Sanderson, that's right. Okay. So his right eye is, uh, okay, go a little farther. head turned, that's based on uh, your testimony that uh, he is looking down the hill, I guess. Is that what you're saying? Uh, I believe his testimony is that he's looking at a woman who's a little downhill to the left. He notices her, looks at her. I don't remember what the exact words are. Okay, go a little farther. So his head, his his left eye would be looking directly at Miss Paltrow. He would see her, right? I believe so. He, and uh, it's inconsistent with his testimony. He didn't see her at all. That's correct. Because, but he would see her there, wouldn't he? I would think so. Okay, go a little farther. Just another fraction. In this picture, you don't, you don't have Dr. Or, uh, Ter or excuse me, Craig Ramon in there. Who, um, how far above would this point be? Where I just pointed, how many yards would that be above this image right here? I, I don't know without doing a measurement, but I'm concentrating on <coughs> the collision between Mr. Sanderson and Ms. Paltrow. Well, Craig Ramon testifies he was about 30 to 40 feet above. And so these objects are about five, you know, bent over, maybe five feet high. So if we just flop over, you know, um, six bodies, we'd get to 30 feet. That would be about right here. I'm not sure. Well, you're an engineer, highly trained PhD. You can't even guesstimate that uh, that would be about 30 feet. I, I can't tell. Would uh, up here be 30 feet? Don't you think it would be a lot more than 30 feet? Probably, but I don't know. Well, you helped create this uh, animation. Uh, you don't know the distances in your own animation? No, no, I've concentrated on the collision portion. That's the biomechanics portion. OK, who, who did the, uh, est the estimates or guesstimates of the distances of the bodies of the other people. So that's going to be uh, Mr. Boggard, who's going to be on soon, I assume. OK, so uh, this animation doesn't have Craig Ramon in, in the scene at all? Not at this point. OK. Is it because the defense doesn't want him in the scene so to discredit his witness account? Oh, I don't think that's the case at all. Um, you'll have to ask Mr. Boggart. OK. We will. OK, let's see. Uh, just go another little section. You just tell me when. I'll yeah. keep going until yeah, you say stop. Yeah, just go slow. I just want to go slow motion. 
Now stop right there. Now, do you know the time, how much time from the initial, let's say, impact of their bodies to this point would be? You did this calculation. This is your, your bailiwick, your, what you're talking about. Do you mean in the animation, or do you mean in real right life? Right now. Yeah. Yeah, from the impact at this point, approximately. Like a you know, fourth of a second, a half a second, a tenth of a second? Do you? Ms. Paltrow says that they're in contact for a little while, a few seconds before they fall over. So um, I, I don't know what it is in particular in this animation, if that's what you're asking. So. Uh, you, you helped design this part of the animation, so you don't know how far it is. You just guessed it. Uh, again, we don't know exact timing and distance. This represents an illustration of the version. So, um, it, yeah, it is what it is. It, it's an, illustrate of, an illustration of a, the version, but there could be wide variability in that version, right? Uh, there is variability, but we have constraints on it. I, the constraints are, you know, could have happened the opposite way, right? The opposite way. No, uh, Ms. Paltrow hit Terry Sanderson. No, I don't think so. Not with the testimony that's given. We have two versions. We have Mr. Ramon's version, and we have Ms. Pal Ms. Paltrow's version. This is Ms. Paltrow's version. Mr. Ramon's version is very different. Okay. Well, let's talk about that for a second. Um, Being paid, uh, excuse me. You're being paid. Uh, what is it? Four twenty-five an hour for this? No. Um, is it more than four twenty-five an hour? It is. Um, four fifty an hour. Yep. Five hundred. It's five hundred an hour. Five hundred an hour. And uh, you build something over ten thousand dollars so far for your work. That sounds about right. More than fifteen thousand. No, I don't think so. So between ten and fifteen thousand. Okay. Uh, you can turn that off for right now. Is it? I'll just take it. I think that's probably better. No, please leave it there. Oh. I may come back to it. What's the best way to do I just disconnect it? Is that? Yeah, maybe just disconnect Like that? Okay. No, you're here to teach the uh, the jury, right? The defendant's version, correct? Uh, teach the jury the physics that would be helpful in understanding how to assess the accident. So that's a, a no. You're not teaching the defendant's version. Uh, I'm not teaching any version. I'm teaching the uh, physics and mechanical engineering, biomechanical engineering, that would help the jury. I, I know it's hard for expert witnesses to say yes or no, but are you teaching the the defendant's version. I guess I don't understand the question. Okay. <coughs> Seemed like a simple question. Next, I'd like to uh, talk about. Uh, did you review Dr. Gibby's testimony at trial? Uh, no, but I did see some of his trial testimony. All of it or some of it? Some of it. Uh, was it more than 10 minutes? Mm, probably, yeah. More than 20 minutes? Yep. More than an hour? I don't think more than an hour. Okay. Uh, you didn't disclose anything about see, uh, hearing Dr. Gibby's testimony? Um, I'm not sure what you mean, but um, I did see it. Okay. Um, uh, you've never disclosed to the plaintiff your reports or your testimony ahead of this trial, correct? Your Honor. Um, may we approach? Yes.
Are you an expert on broken ribs? Um, I am comfortable talking about the biomechanics related to rib fractures. Have you done any papers or studies or research on ribs and fr rib fractures? Me personally, no, but I've read the biomechanical and engineering literature relevant to them. Okay. Um, uh, you haven't mentioned that biomechanical literature in specifics, correct? I'm not sure about in specifics, but I think we mentioned it on direct. Okay. Um. So you, you said that uh, Dr. Sanderson, or I'm just going to call him Terry. Terry was 70 years old at the time of this crash? He was 69, but effectively 70 for biomechanics purposes. Effectively because 70 is older? No, because um, there's actually good information in the biomechanical engineering literature about the amount of chest compression required to create rib fractures for 70-year-olds. Um, and not 69-year-olds? Well, it's actually the full distribution, but the paper that I'm thinking of from Agnew specifically talks about 70-year-olds. You didn't mention that paper today. No, but you, would you like it? Uh, not right now, thanks. Okay. I've not seen it. Um, let's see. Well, I'm going to go right to the another point. You have this theory of rotation, correct? That your ver the version you're calling Miss um, Paltrow's version is a kind of a rotation version. Um, there is some rotation. It may be a little. It might be more than a little. We don't know. Okay, so we don't know how much rotation there is, correct? Sure. Okay. I'd like to. Let me see what this thing is. It did work last time. I guess it's working now. May we take a picture of this? I think you've already done it. Okay. Or someone on your team has. Okay, good. May I borrow a pen? Yeah. Your Honor, we would object to him writing on the witness's board. It's not an exhibit. He's, it's certainly fair game. Okay. So. Well, doctor, can we mark it as an exhibit, Your Honor? Why don't you take a picture of it, and you can use that, and then he can ahead, add, he can add to it. Okay. I mean, it is our board. Right, and in academic we, fields, we don't we don't have any questions pre uh, right now. So, in academic fields, it's common that uh, people write on each other's uh, uh, drawings. Correct. I don't know that I've seen that, but I don't have a problem with you drawing. Okay. So. Um, you testified that uh, Craig Ramon says uh, Terry was hit directly in the back, and they went down. And Craig Ramon was somewhere above 30 to 40 feet, and it happened in a fraction of a second. Correct? Uh, yes, the fall. I would agree with that. Okay, less than a second. Sure. Okay. So uh, there was a scream. So with, and the scream occurred, and there was within a fraction of a second. And uh, I don't believe uh, Craig Ramon never testified where Miss Paltrow's skis were. Correct. So her skis could have been going underneath Terry, like this. Uh, so um, the pink ones are, would be Miss Paltrow's skis. 
Is that a version that is possible? It is not. It's a, uh, you're saying it's not possible. That is not possible with the version that Mr. Ramon states. His version uh, didn't talk about her skis. Now, here, I'll draw what her body, let's, pink would be her body, still square in the back. Isn't that possible? So, no, with Mr. Ramon's version, if I may, um, that is not possible. So in this situation here, when Mr. Sanderson's skis go into a V, and I guess you're saying her skis are under his skis, which I'm not sure how that happens because the tips curve up, but we'll go with it. Um, somehow she winds up in this situation getting caught with her left ski around Mr. Sanderson and she would not continue past five to 10 feet and I would expect a twisting release of her left ski. Well, that's her version. I'm talking about Mr. Ramon's version. No, no, no. I'm talking about what you just drew for Mr. Ramon's version. Mr. Ramon's version. Well, isn't it possible her skis could be pointing straight like this? And uh, let me get it right here. So, yeah, so she could be going straight and she could be turning left and up and hit square in the back. But her, and her skis are pointed this way. Isn't that another version? So for her skis so to miss. Question. Oh, no, it's not. Do you want me to explain? Uh, in a second. I, I want, I'm asking the questions here. So, the, uh, so are you saying that her body could not be turned while her skis are going in one direction or she's turning up to the left? Is that, is that possible? Not for Mr. Ramon's version. Is it possible in general? Sure. But okay. in her version, I'm sorry, well, in his I, version. Yeah. This happened in a fraction of a second. I don't think Mr. Ramon testified that he has a videographic or photographic memory. Do you? Well, he's pretty particular in his testimony about how she was on Mr. Sanderson's back. Right. And he could, uh, you see the circle I have? Let's see. Well, actually, um, maybe I could do it the other I've got it wrong. Uh, let's do it the other way. Her, her body could be like this, and her skis could be like this, too. And people turn all the time while they're skiing, and their skis are going one direction, but their body is pointing a different way. Right here. Can you see me? See that? I see you turning, sure. That's possible, right? What, what you're doing in general is possible. Are you asking, does that match with Mr. Ramon's testimony? No, well, and I'm happy to explain why. I think Mr. Ramon's testimony is, uh, it happens in a fraction of a second. Mr. Ramon, a professional wannabe freestyle skier, um, likes to talk about ski angles, but the main part is the body. He saw the body, and then the bodies go down together and she lands on top of him. You're saying that your versions, which you are not based on anything except uh, your recreation of the biomechanics, are superior to an eyewitness. Isn't that what you're saying? No, we have two versions of the accident. We have Mr. Ramon's version, and we have Miss Paltrow's version. I have assessed both using physics and biomechanics, and I'm sorry to say, Mr. Ramon's version does not meet with the, the laws of physics. It's not consistent, internally consistent, and Ms. Paltrow's is. Well, I don't think Mr. Ramon's version was designed to be consistent with the version of events. It happened in a, less than a second, and uh, we don't know the direction of the skis. In his version, he never testified to the, to the direction of Ms. Paltrow's skis in any of his testimony. Isn't that true? He did not testify to the direction of her skis, that's true. Thank you. So if Miss Paltrow was seen down, turning up to the left, she hits the Terry Sanderson square in the back, and they go they can fall down to the right, especially if her momentum uh, 
uh, it's going, well, you know, I'm not a biomechanical engineer. I'll try to do it right here. Her it could be her shoulder that hits him square in the back, couldn't it? He didn't say what part of Miss Paltrow's body hit Miss Mr. Sanderson, did he? He did not say. He said, well, here, I can tell you what, exactly what he said. He said... Okay, take your time. said squarely in the back she couldn't have hit him in the back any better right in the middle than if she tried and she couldn't have been back on his back any more than if he would have strapped her on the back uh, like a backpack okay but that doesn't mean she, her body was straight might not be exactly straight yeah it could be off center because she was skiing down she's like this and she hits him right in the back or maybe it was a little off center because Mr. Ramon off center because Mr. Ramon only had the view for a few seconds. And then her arms wrap around her arms could have wrapped around Terry Sanderson, right? I don't think there's any testimony about that. Is it possible? Maybe, but Well, I don't where think would there's they testimony. have gone? Down to the side? She went in like this? Um, in front of her? Um, I mean, the most likely, don't skiers ski like this usually? Often. Often. What are the other positions? Uh, they can have her arms in more. Okay. And so have them out more. So she could be like have this. Have arms down to her like this. And the poles heading back. Okay. There's all sorts of options. So in that fraction of a second, Mr. Ramon saw the collision. The screen was up here. He turns his head. And she could hit him square in the back. She could have her... At that point, her body could have turned and possibly hit her. But the point is, the skis could have been going at a different angle, one or the other, and still caused this crash. And your versions assume those are not possible be because you uh, assume that, that there's only one way, that their skis were going parallel to each other. This is, the this is your only assumption, right? Wrong. You, you, assume, you made assumptions that these are possible? I looked at other angles, that's right. And the testimony, though, you said uh, there's no testimony about the angle of her skis from Mr. Ramon, correct? That's true. made a lot of assumptions correct to make these animations right um, yes and no I thought that would be a, a more than one assumption <laughs> there are That's some yes assumptions no. sure more than one assumption okay less than a hundred sure less than ten I don't know you don't know how many assumptions you've made, correct? That's right, sure. Okay. Now, I know counsel, Mr. Owens, likes to do this a lot, like it's a touchdown. But on redirect, Mr. Ramon, you, did you see all of his testimony this, uh, for this trial? I don't know if I saw all of it, but it, certainly I saw a lot of it. Okay. You saw the testimony last week, correct? Is there any more than that? There was a little bit yesterday. Okay. I didn't see anything Had yesterday. I was this. traveling. Had to do with that he report, Mr. Ramon reported what he, he saw the same day in the same week seven years ago and you're recreating this what about five months ago correct I don't remember when it was less than a year ago I don't recall you don't recall when you uh, made your uh, consulted with mr. Brill and made the animation this has been ongoing for a while this case has been dragging on so I don't know when it was so 
you've been working on this for, a, let's say, more than eight months? Sure. You don't know? Um, certainly we've been in contact with uh, council for longer than eight months. And for the record, Your Honor, I'd like to move to strike all of his testimony because it, this wasn't disclosed improperly. I, I anticipate the ruling, but I just want to, for the record, make the ruling. It's overruled. It was disclosed properly, counsel. Okay. What I'd like to do is uh, understand that you've made a lot of assumptions, and the jury would like to know how reliable your opinions are. So how can that be reliable when you totally discount some major events like what the direction of Miss Paltrow's body was compared to her skis? And uh, there is testimony about Miss Paltrow's uh, body movement. Um, do you know that? Ooh, I guess prior I don't understand. To the crash, your... Just prior to the crash? What version are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. Sorry. Uh, do you know the, about the version of Carrie Oaks? Um, I don't think she saw the accident. Have you read her deposition? I have. Okay. Uh, you realize she testified that one of the kids said, Mommy, watch us ski. Um, and the kids were up there on the left. Miss Paltrow was down on the right, which would tend to show that Miss Paltrow was looking up to her left at the point of collision. I don't recall that. Okay. You're, you're excluding Carrie Oaks's testimony, correct? That's wrong. You're including her testimony? I considered it, sure. And you, are there any assumptions you've made based on her testimony? Not in particular that I can think of, but there may be. So could you speak up? Not in particular that I can think of. Okay. Not particularly that you can think of about Carrie Oaks's testimony, okay? Are you an expert on head injuries? Um, I'm comfortable talking about head injuries from the biomechanics standpoint. Have you ever studied uh, or held yourself out as an expert on concussion? Uh, if it's diagnosing or treating concussion, no. If it's the biomechanics related to the formation of concussion, yes, I've done helmet research and head injury research, in particular for snow sports. Did you apply any of your knowledge about concussion to this case? I certainly looked at it, but Dr. Baim was very particular in his testimony that it was only the rib fractures that allowed him to say that Ms. Paltrow contacted Mr. Sanderson from behind. So that's what I concentrated on for the jury. And you ignored his discussion about the head injury? Oh no, I certainly considered it. And it's not relevant in this case? Well, in disproving Dr. Baim, it's not relevant, but I'm happy to talk about it. Okay. Well, it's not clear you disproved Dr. Baim when you don't even know the direction of Ms. Paltrow's skis at the, at the beginning of this. It's also, I think, a, a big assumption to say what the body position of Ms. Paltrow was when she hit Terry Sanderson in the back. Sustained, and I don't. Was there a question in there, counsel? Um, just if that was accurate, I'll withdraw it. studied rib injuries, uh, have you ever testified about rib injuries before? Could you clarify what, what the question, question is? is? Have you ever studied rib injuries um, and t t testified about them in the past? That sounds like two questions. Have you ever testified about rib injuries in the past? I, I don't recall, but okay. it's likely. Most likely you have? I, I think so. How many they're, they're have common. you testified more than 100 times? In trial, probably 35 times, something in that ballpark. In total, under oath, have you testified more than 100 times? Including depositions, yes. More than, uh, less than 200 times? I would agree with that. 
Okay. That's all I have for now. Thank you, Dr. Scher. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bueller. Mr. Egan. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Scher, we'll, we'll just be real quick here. Did anything Mr. Bueller asked you change your opinion that Ms. Paltrow's account is consistent with the laws of physics to your understanding and Mr. Ramon's is not? That remains the same. Thanks. Mr. Bueller? Just, um, I think you said this before, that you're an expert in the laws of physics, but you're not an expert in medical uh, medicine or, or um, orthopedics or neurology, correct? I am a biomechanical engineer. I am not a medical doctor. I do not diagnose and treat, but I do look at what forces and what motions create damage to the body. You may step down. Thank you. Thank you. you. May I call your next witness? We call Paul Bogger, Your Honor. Thank you. Your Honor, before, before Mr. Bogger comes up to testify, we may want to take a five or ten minute break. I want to address something with the court outside the presence of the jury. We'll have to take one shortly anyway, so let's go ahead and do it now. Ms. Van Orman. Your Honor, pursuant to our motion in limiting, Mr. Bogger's testimony is going to be significantly limited in this case. Um, the problem that I am foreseeing is that, um, I and I could be wrong, but it appears to me that counsel is going to try and use Mr. Bogger to then um, describe some further animations and place individuals on that animation. And I have significant concerns with that for a number of reasons. Number one, Mr. Bogger's not um, qualified to do that. He didn't take any kind of measurements, calculations, determinations of speed, force, physics, et cetera, in this case. But in addition, in his report, he does not make any mention of where people were, where they were placed. This would. It, any kind of discussion of him talking about the animation and if he was responsible for putting the people somehow on that um, animation. He does not describe that in his report. He doesn't talk that in his report regarding um, participating in an animation. He provides no diagrams in his report, no discussions of where people were or weren't. So I don't think that it would be appropriate for him to even deal with the animation or that his testimony that he's the one that was responsible for putting, say, Apple here and Moses here and that type of thing. That would go significantly beyond anything he did in his report. So that's my concern, and I wanted to address that now rather than a sidebar. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Egan? Yes, Your Honor. So uh, I think our response would be that um, Mr. Bogger has poured over the records in this case, and he has, um, in producing these animations, made certain assumptions about which, uh, what testimony um, might be consistent with the illustration that the animations provide. He can be very clear with the jury that he's uh, assuming certain facts. He's not finding these facts. He's assuming that they're true. They come from the record. He can explain that they're, they're rough illustrations. He's not made measurements and decided that, yes, it's, this is exactly 30 feet. 
he, he can be subject to cross-examination on, um, on any point that might be inconsistent with testimony. He can explain that he chose to assume these facts and not other facts, and that if you assumed other facts, you might get different illustration. Um, and then uh, he, you know, he will explain that the, the assumption of various facts that are shown in the um, animations are consistent with his understanding of ski collisions and ski, sp ski, skiing generally, which he has decades of experience, not just with skiing himself, but with uh, investigating accidents, collisions, uh, hundreds and hundreds of them for um, various purposes, m mostly not litigation, mostly to figure out risk management concerns, deciding whether certain skiers have to be banned from a, a certain resort or a ski area. Um, he's, uh, he has a, uh, ample experience to be able to discuss how to um, consider various factors in, in um, uh, evaluating a ski collision like this that has complex um, uh, testimony that's not all consistent. And the jury, in our, in our view, uh, needs to hear from a ski expert that knows how to do that and can explain to them the principles that he uses. He will not tell the jury this is likely what happened or that uh, I have found that this, has, this must be the case. He will say, I've assumed these facts. He can be very clear about what he's assumed and then use that animation to explain to the jury how to think through the case given his ample experience with evaluating ski collisions. Mr. Egan, I guess I'm still not hearing an expert opinion from Mr. Bogger, is it, mm -hmm. that uh, that would have helped the jury? I mean, it, you're, everything that I'm hearing has him weighing evidence, has him making decisions about what may have happened on that day, and that's invading the providence of the jury. It's not really going to help them. Your Honor, I see it as... Uh, like say a medical malpractice case, which I'm more familiar with, if a certain set of facts might be in the record about what happened in a surgery, for example, then a surgeon, expert surgeon who has lots of experience reviewing uh, records, but also doing the surgery himself, knowing what the training is, um, uh, looks at the records, looks at the various claims, and, and you, as you said in uh, your, um, order ruling, I believe, yesterday can say, I, if we assume these facts, given my expertise, I can say this makes sense or this is consistent with my understanding of surgery. Um, and so my, um, my proposal is that we use Mr. Bogger in that sort of way where he can help the jury understand, given w what he knows about skiing and given what he, he's seen in the record, that there are certain um, principles you can use if you assume certain facts to um, uh, to evaluate uh, a certain collision, such that you, uh, you you're applying some rational principles rather than just generally um, uh, going with a certain gestalt feeling about s what someone said. You're actually trying to rationally go through how to evaluate a ski collision, which again he has decades and decades of experience doing, and he won't say uh, he'll say to the jury, you're um, uh, the ones that have to decide what happened. This is a very difficult case to decide. Isn't your, your medical malpractice expert example, isn't that an expert that's coming in to evaluate whether the standard of care was breached? Yeah, well, so uh, yes, usually we would, we would offer an expert in that way, but given your ruling, I'm, I'm just trying to use that as an analogy where we could still use expertise that would help the jury without rendering that, that final opinion, telling them, you know, as an expert, uh, you know, you should, you should do this, and I'm really the one that knows because I have tons of experience. Instead, he can say, here's, here's how I evaluate these accidents, and let me show you how to do it. And then they have, they have rational principles that come from his field of you know, uh, skiing and ski accident evaluation that, that help them, that they have not heard, they haven't heard from any ski expert that has provided to them that kind of a rational um, layout for analyzing the various complex um, claims in this case. And I think that would help them. Sure. And, and I think I, in my 
I guess, preliminary ruling on this witness the other day, yesterday. Um, I'm losing track of the days here. Yeah, me too. Um, I think I stated that he is qualified, certainly has qualifications, and can testify as to what a reasonable skier would do or not do in a certain hypothetical set of facts. But in terms of applying and weighing the evidence in this case, I think that goes too far. Okay, so, but but if if we showed the animation and we made it clear to the jury that we're assuming certain facts, we're not we're not weighing them. We're just saying look, let's let's take these facts. We're assuming them. We're not saying that they're proven. We're just showing you how to analyze the facts, assuming these uh, these various parts of the testimony are true. That would be too far. You're saying that sounds like closing argument. It okay. doesn't sound like a, what a witness can offer under Rule 702. He can talk about, I mean, he's, he's an expert in skiing. He can talk about skiing dynamics. He can explain what a snowplow is, what parallel skiing is, um, what, uh, what the rules of, of skiing are generally understood to be. But in terms of taking that next leap, I don't, I don't think he can, he can say, I've looked at the deposition testimony and I can tell you who's at fault here, or I can tell you who did something wrong here. Um, I just don't see, I think that's the jury's responsibility. And I don't want a witness telling the jury how to make its decisions or how to think, how to, how to make a decision that's uh, either an ultimate issue or one of the issues leading up to that ultimate issue. So even him explaining his process for how to evaluate ski collisions would be too far? To what end? Why does the jury need to know how he evaluates a ski collision? Because evaluating ski collisions is a complex matter, and he has expertise as to how to do that. Yeah, you know, right now I'm just talking in a, uh, or I'm I'm responding to your question sort of in a vacuum. I don't know what it is he's offering. Um, if it would help, I could give you kind of an example. Like, sure. If I could say, you, Mr. Bogger, when you evaluate ski collisions, and you've evaluated, you know, have established that he's evaluated hundreds of and hundreds of ski collisions. Um, have you ever evaluated collisions where there's conflicting testimony? Yes. When you approach that testimony, what are principles you use to evaluate that? And he can explain those principles. He doesn't have to talk about the facts of this case. He can explain, here are these principles. I don't think the jury's heard that. I think it would be helpful to them. I think it would be rational and not over, it wouldn't be so overbearing. Ask, asking him how he evaluates credibility. Um, I guess that's true. How does he reconcile different accounts? Right, but we wouldn't, if, I mean, if given your ruling, we, we wouldn't go into applying it to this case. We would just give them the rational principles that would help them uh, weigh the evidence. It wouldn't tell them how to do it. It would just give them a framework for doing it, which only he can provide. Uh, they have not heard from somebody that, has, that does this for a living, has done it again. And how not does just that vary from what the jury does? If you look at the credibility jury instruction that I've already read, mm -hmm. for example, and how does that differ? I mean, where, where it talks about conflicting testimony, how does it, how does what he's offering provide any specialized knowledge? I, I consider that generalized. Yeah, knowledge. so I don't think he would just talk about you know um, general principles of evaluating witnesses. He would talk about particular aspects of a ski ski slope like, or witnesses like what? on a. Um, if he were here right now, he could help me. Um, um, he is right here. Yeah, right. He is right here. So when, when uh, ski accidents happen uh, um, and people go to the ground, their their skis get released. I could see that as specialized yeah. knowledge, just right. like this witness offered yeah. something along those lines. Yeah. No, that is an, that that is an important thing he can. Explain but in terms that. of this skier said such and such, and this skier said such and such. But this is what I this is how I evaluate that aspect of it. I think that's invading the providence of the jury okay on deciding how to weigh testimony okay I mean for the record if if I may your honor but we'll, we'll just I think we put this on before but in case we didn't we we believe the motion uh, to exclude dr. Bogger or limit his testimony is untimely and that um, Greg Scordis their expert who whose report does much the same thing that Mr. Bogger's report does should be limited in the same way. Um, and uh, again, just 
renew our request that he be able to speak to the jury about his evaluation of the ski accident. So just again, my, my sort of ultimate conclusion on what I'm hearing from on this uh, motion to reconsider and on the response from the defense is that it's up to the jury to decide ultimately what the parties did, where the parties were positioned, and who ran into whom. So it's up for the jury to make those decisions. So as long as this witness steers clear of those areas, that's the main emphasis of my of my preliminary ruling, and I'll have to hear what is what's being offered. Okay. Right. Do you mind? Uh, I know I'm not an old man, but my memory has failed me. Those three again, who hit whom going backwards? It's up to the jury to decide ultimately what the parties did. Right. In other words, leading up to, during, and after the accident. It's up for the jury to decide that. Um, where the and, and various experts have given them some helpful information, like the uh, the, the biomedical expert uh, gave testimony as to what the biomedical evidence reflected that would help the jury make that decision. Just like this past witness gave the jury some uh, uh, biomechanical information that will help the jury make their decision about what happened in that accident, what the parties did where the parties were positioned, and who ran into whom. And, and the reason that you see Mr. Bagra as doing something different than, like, say, Dr. Schur just did, who took the jury through assuming these various facts, I'm not telling you that this account is true, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, and I'm just taking there the, the, as an assumption what Ms. Paltrow said was true, let's analyze it. You're seeing Mr. Bagra as different, and, and I'm not totally sure how. Do you mind well, explaining that? Well, the plaintiff's witness um, applied biomedical principles in a methodical way to the different versions and then handed the jury that information. The biomechanical expert that just testified uh, applied biomechanical principles to the different versions and gave that information to the jury to help them make a decision. Okay. So, And, and what, I, what I see this witness doing is reading different accounts and reconciling them and wanting to give the, his, his reconciliation to the jury, which I think is too close to what the jury actually does. It doesn't provide any, it doesn't help the jury from an expert standpoint. Okay, so it sounds like you're not persuaded that, that you know, of our position, which is that he has skiing expertise similar to like a biomechanical engineer has and can, and can apply that to the facts in a way that would pro provide the jury with some, again, rational um, scheme to assess the, the uh, accident that they wouldn't Principles have otherwise. Under Rule 702. Right. Okay. And, and the same would like, is likely going to hold true to Mr. Scordis' testimony. Okay. And you say likely? I haven't, I mean, I've heard, heard. I've heard you make kind of a motion. I haven't heard from the other side whether they're opposing that in some way. I see. You're just waiting until you have but more I said, specifics. I mean, if he's the same type of an expert, and I, I realize that he may, he may not be a risk manager and he may not uh, uh, be a, a ski accident investigator for, for a, an employer, but it sounds like his testimony is along the same lines. Right. Okay. So um, just in terms of guidance on this ruling, um, you, you, you mentioned the bindings, and I apologize if we're going long. I just want to make sure that we... Um, Specialized knowledge right. so that can help the jury in making their decision. So would, in your mind, would something like recognizing that uh, the positioning of the skiers, if one skier is uphill, uh, applying a, a certain knowledge of skiing, um, uh, that, that would suggest certain things about the accident, would that be out of bounds? I guess I have to hear the question, but it, uh, it sounds like you're getting back into the, you know, making conclusions based on an investigation. If you say, if you, uh, if you lay out some hypothetical facts to say if this skier was here and this skier was here, um, from a skiing standpoint, you know, and then ask questions based on that, I could see that, but okay. um, I, it, it's feeling a little too hypothetical right now. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Thanks for your patience with my okay. my questions. Sure. Ms. Van Orman. Yeah, just really quickly, back to, circling back to why I, I raised this in the first place, is the concern with the animation. And so what I don't want, because Mr. Bogger apparently 
had some involvement in in creating the animation, which was not designated in his report, nor was any mention on what his involvement was, what he did for it, how he placed anybody any, anywhere. There's no discussion of any of that. I don't think that it's appropriate for him to comment on the animation and to say, well, yes, I, I saw that. You know, This helps me because I'm the one who helped to place these people there. It would have been, again, by reading the depositions and applying, which is what the jury needs to do. So I would say he can't even talk about the animations because that just goes beyond the scope of his report, anything that he's done in the case. I would agree. Unless the foundation can be set. I, mean, I haven't heard anything that would establish a foundation. I we have no, been no broadsided, problem. Your Honor. We had a 37-page report produced a long, long time ago. There was a motion deadline that we uh, respected months ago. The, th these issues were ordered, were argued 45 days ago. And then immediately before our witness is going to take the stand with this 37-page report, 37-page report, like filing, and that guts half of his opinions. I, I don't think it's fair, Your Honor. I can't even read the darn thing. I'm focused on getting my witnesses ready. Uh, the untimeliness is very prejudicial to us, Your Honor, because we can't properly brief this in days. Okay, I've, I've already ruled that the that the initial motion was timely, it, and and I made a ruling on the initial motion. The subsequent motion was not untimely. The court has agreed to reconsider the motion, and that's what I've done. And I, I don't feel that it's unfair or unduly prejudicial. You were aware of the issues with his report uh, long ago. But, but you ruled in our favor before. What I ruled was that the, that the initial motion didn't give the court enough to grant it. Because they and so then there was a motion briefed to it. Then there was a motion to reconsider that gave the court more information. And I can see that it would be, I mean. You can't poorly brief you don't want a motion. To, I mean, this would create an appealable issue. Do you want to do that for your client is my question. No, but I don't, I don't want to. They poorly brief something, the judge denies it. Then right before the testimony, they better brief it, and now we lose. I mean. That's what trial is. This is trial. Things happen. Um, the, the points that were raised in the motion are valid points. They're sound. They're based soundly in the law, and I, do, and I want to make sure that what the jury hears is sound and, and not subject to any more risk of appeal than possible. So we'll take five before the jury comes back.
Ready for the jury? Yes. Okay. I, I didn't hear anything, so they, they went to get the jury. I see that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Owens, you may proceed. It's James again. Okay, Mr. Egan? We call Paul Bogger our ski expert. Thank you. Mr. Bogger? If you could walk right over here to the clerk and she will swear you in as a witness. Do you swear that the testimony you are about to give in the case now before the court will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you, God? Thank you. Good morning. Would you start by uh, sitting down and then giving the jury your full name and spelling it once you get situated? Thank you very much. Yes, my name is Paul Bogger, P A U L B A U G H E R. Your Honor, I note that my computer is still there. Do you oh. mind if I grab it? Mr. Bogger, thank you for being with us. Um, thank you. Will you tell the jury what you understand to be your role here today? Yes, I was uh, retained to do an investigation to consider all the circumstances involved in the accident uh, that you've been sitting through here. And I've also been asked to, if asked to assume certain facts, I could give opinions as to how that might work, would that be plausible, do I see this? I think maybe a lot of what I would um, hope to add today would be to uh, sort of give the operational side, the skiing side, the things that we observe in accidents and when we evaluate them, what we learn and what I pass on. I do a lot of teaching and training, which we can get into, but those are, I think, the sort of the key, the key areas. So do you have expertise to help educate the jury about the skier responsibility code? Yes. Or just reasonable principles about how to ski? Yes. Um, what about how, like for example, um, bindings uh, and ski equipment might factor into uh, how they might work in a certain collision? Yes. And why do you, why, why do you have uh, confidence that you can explain that and um, uh, with authority to the jury? Well, I've been involved in uh, working professionally in the ski industry for 37 years, and I've primarily focused on the outdoor, on snow, skiing, more specifically ski safety. Uh, that involves ski accidents. I do a lot of ski accident investigation. I mean, literally thousands and thousands. And I've done a lot of collisions. I've worked on a lot of collisions, and I, I haven't just done it at one ski area, my home ski area, but I've, uh, I actually had four ski areas that I did uh, 
risk management oversight for, and, and I'm a primarily a patrol director at my base, uh, but then I moved into more supervisory roles that started to involve other ski areas as well, including one in Canada, one here in Utah that you're probably familiar with, Brighton. And uh, those experiences of looking at these accidents in a variety of locations uh, has given me quite a bit of information I can use to A, do the day-to-day -day, uh, use of that. Do we need to address certain issues on the hill? Uh, do we need to uh, remove a skier, for example, if somebody's unsafe in bad collisions and bad accidents? We, we really do need to learn as much as we can. We, we get medical feedback. We, we, get, we just consider a lot of information. And then the last piece of that is I pass a lot of that on. I've been training and teaching people in the ski industry about accident investigation, skier collisions, skier safety uh, for the last 20 years. And so I, I've been all over on, on that. Do you have any higher education? Uh, yes, I have a degree in economics. And what about um, certifications that are related to ski sports or skiing? Yes, I, I would have a number of certifications. I'm not sure how many of them would bear directly on uh, the ski accident part, but uh, you know, I'm an EMT, um, an, an instructor of outdoor emergency care, um, a licensed blaster, an aerial blaster, which means uh, we can use explosives from helicopters and, and uh, mostly for avalanche control. Well, I guess only for avalanche control. If there's anything else, it'd prob <laughs> probably be a big problem for me. <laughs> I'm sure my license doesn't say that. But, uh, and then I have a number of uh, schools that I've attended, uh, avalanche schools and various uh, ski risk management type uh, things. And then, you know, as I said, really the last 20, 25 years of my career, I've been mostly teaching and training others, whether it's in uh, the National Avalanche School, which we actually just held here in Utah in the fall, or uh, consulting for ski areas, working with the National Ski Areas Association on national safety campaigns. The National Ski Patrol System is on the National Safety Board. And, and so there's a lot of related things. Um, but uh, I mean, I think that's the gist. Uh, you know, I've been involved in, you know, I like to even say, as you know, I've been referred to as an expert in this for a long time, and I've done a lot of trials and testimony on ski cases. But I always think of myself, too, as a student. I'm, I'm, all, I'm, I'm continually learning about it. I always want to know the next thing. And you think they're all the same, and a lot are fairly similar, but there's always something new and something different. So, Have you ever, in your um, capacity you mentioned of uh, reviewing cases for litigation or giving testimony, in court cases. Have you ever done that in Utah before? Yes. Yes, I had a... When uh, was that? Well, I've had a, a number of uh, skier collisions that I've investigated here now with Brighton. That's more my oversight, and I'm reviewing the accident records. And then when we have a, a bigger collision that has more issues and so forth, or a ski accident for that matter, you know, I'll get involved and I, you know, I'll start going through a review like much like we've been doing here. And um, I had a trial, I think three or four years ago in Salt Lake, uh, Solitude, the ski area was involved. And um, uh, Park City, I've had a couple of collisions uh, at Park City that I've done expert reports and, and so forth. But, uh, you know, those cases settled. But, but anyway, so yeah, and that's, again, I think what's different about what I do than say, maybe what Mr. Graff would have been doing uh, it, when he was the patrol manager is that I, I do travel and I do go to all the different parts of the country, including the East Coast uh, for accidents and uh, the investigations and skier collisions happen basically everywhere. And, and that's been a, I'd say I've probably had 20 uh, cases that have gone to trial that I've been involved in. Maybe they haven't all gone to trial, but at least that have been in litigation. And are you aware of any studies or have you done any measurements of how common ski accidents might be? Well, I'm certainly, uh, I, I work with people who, who actually are involved in the, uh, what we call the 10-year interval studies. And there's been four 10-year interval studies about ski accidents and the mechanisms of ski accidents. Um, I look at that data 
I also, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I think you heard Dr. Shear earlier describing the ISSS, uh, the, the Snow Sports and Trauma, uh, you know, the International Congress for Ski Safety on that, and, and I've presented there, I've presented a, I, you know, I can't probably keep track of all the different meetings and, and groups that I've presented to, but these are bigger groups, the ISS, S, and then I've, you know, I also present papers and, and do peer-reviewed uh, uh, work. The International Snow Science Conference, ISSW workshop, hasn't, <laughs> that was dreamed up in the 80s, they haven't lost that part of it, but it's a conference, it's an international conference, a thousand people there. I do reports on things that happen, ski area problems, ski, uh, in fact, uh, one ski problem with the uh, snow immersion suffocation. I don't know if you've heard of that. You might have heard of tree well fatalities. Did you remember? The, we just had one here in, in Utah. And, and so that would be something I would gather data on. I talked to the general manager of the ski area that it happened adjacent to and, and uh, talked to the folks from the Avalanche Center here, Forecast Center. And uh, they have some educational outreach that they do. And, and I basically was at the uh, front of the snow immersion piece. I, I helped coin that term and, and we did it. You know, I keep a database. I keep doing ongoing research. I see you have another yeah. question coming. No, no, it's but fine. Well, I would just, if you don't idea. mind me interrupting. So the, the, when it comes to measuring the, the, how common a, a ski collisions might be on a, a, in a given region or in a given place at a given time. Do you have any particular data you can offer? Yeah, well, certainly. Um, if you looked at, I mentioned those interval studies, uh, the rate in skiing accidents, the total skiing accidents of collisions is about 6 to 7% of all of the reported accidents. Now, I'm sure there's a lot of collisions where people just bump into each other and go on their way, probably a lot more of those. But uh, ones that result. Your, your Honor, I'm just going to object that I, I'm fine if this is just background foundation on uh, Mr. Bogger's experience, but this goes beyond anything contained in his report. I see it as background, so overruled. Yeah, that's fine as long as it's background. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, yeah, so um, that rate at 6 to 7% is sort of uncanny from interval to interval, so 40 years of data now and it's still the same. And now I use that metric myself because I'm looking at the four ski areas that I'm supervising and then the other ski areas that I go to when I do investigations, I look at their data because the first thing I want to know is what is that rate here? And it can vary throughout the season based on weather conditions and snow surfaces and so forth. But um, you know, that's a metric is are we doing okay? Do we have a problem? Is there something that needs to be addressed? And so I, I look at it well, in, in all accidents, there's all kinds of data you can get from accidents, not just skier collisions, in that way. And then we try to pass that information on. Sometimes we target it towards uh, safety outreach. What, you can look at a lot of safety stuff on the National Ski Areas Association website that anybody can log on to and look at the safety pages and a lot of stuff on collisions that's in there and skiing safely and so forth. I had a lot to offer in, okay. uh, in the production of all that. Thank you. Um, do you have any knowledge of how what the rate of uh, ski collisions um, might be in Utah? How Ye common they are? Yes, and it would be almost identical. Yeah, there might be again minor variations from ski area to ski area. But if you looked at Deer Valley, for example, which I did, and I asked this question during my site inspection, and their rate is just right in there. It's probably six percent, seven percent. How many collisions? And I'm talking not ski accidents, but collisions where two skiers are hitting against each other. Uh, how many uh, collisions like that have you investigated, evaluated in your career? Yeah, I, I looked through uh, sort of back through the accident review data that I keep and to just look at what you saw the other day, the incident report form, and maybe it's got something like an additional patroller comment or a ski instructor's uh, incident report. Um, I looked through that and I figured that there have been about 4,000 of those that I reviewed out of about 44,000 accidents with just the incident report form that I've looked at. That's all accidents, but collisions, about 4,000. And then things that really got more investigated where there's things like we're doing here, 
um, 550 is so that's a, it's a lot of accidents and a lot of collisions in those collisions over a long period of time sorry sorry I, no, I just wanted to make sure yes. nobody will think skiing is safe anymore yeah, right? yeah. I finish that so um, when you've done um, those evaluations uh, what is your role what are you trying to accomplish as you evaluate those accidents well sometimes we need to find the cause mostly we want to know the cause and cer certainly that's how you can target prevention but we also want to learn circumstances sometimes we have really bad injuries in these collisions and it's important for us to make sure we know is there somebody at fault or people meeting the responsibilities and so we're looking at that all the time and part of that is we want to make sure since we're all responsible as skiers that includes the ski areas me you if you're skiers that we share safety and we all do it together and we all have responsibilities and, and if one of us is not doing our job people get hurt and so we need to evaluate fault at times and we may address some people that we actually remove from the mountain uh, we've had people go in cop cars uh, off of the mountain but uh, you know we're serious about it we want our skiers to know that we're serious about it and they feel okay bringing their kids there that we're not just turning a blind eye so in your evaluation of these various collisions what have you learned about what the inherent risks of skiing are well certainly skiers face a variety of inherent risks and those are often codified into uh, especially in states that have a lot of skiing in them like utah or washington state or california you know there's there's what they call like a ski safety statute in uh, in the regs and so uh, it will mention many times it'll enumerate what some of those inherent risks are another place you can find those inherent risks are on trail signs are mandatory here in utah that, that they're publicly displayed but also with the ticket back sometimes that varies from place to place but um, do you want me to list uh, any of the inherent risks or? sure yeah just educate the jury given your experience investigating these various uh, collisions uh, and just your experience as a, as a long time advanced skier what are those in inherent risks objection your honor relevance overruled Thank you. Uh, yes, so things that you encounter as a skier, things that you could likely uh, have a problem with if you weren't paying attention and weren't following uh, your, your role, your duties, of uh, things that we would identify under things like the Ski Responsibility Code, which we can talk about, but, but terrain changes, uh, forest growth, bare spots, things that you might run into objects lift towers uh, grooming machines snowmobiles we try to keep those off the hill when people are around but you know that's part of the sport people need to get lift maintenance people need to get around the mountain so uh, snowmobiles about would in, be in there oh sorry oh, I, I, yes go ahead i was just going to say what about inherent risks relating to ski collisions yeah in and, that, and that's where i was coming to yeah. so i wanted to give you the broad brush and then say and things like inbounds avalanches you can actually get even if they do the mitigation, you can actually get uh, into an avalanche inbounds, and that's a risk you hadn't seen identified for a while, but about five or six years ago, we started adding that one, and collisions, skier collisions, or even collisions with lift towers and objects, but skier collisions, as we know, six to seven percent of the accidents, we can eliminate some things, but an inherent risk, you cannot, and the definition there is the risk is inherent in the sport you cannot remove it without fundamentally altering the sport as it exists today so that means using good following our good responsibilities and being prudent skiers we can reduce the risk but we can't eliminate it so does that mean that sometimes collisions occur despite uh, people reasonably skiing on both sides of an accident yes that happens all the time and when you investigate collisions, do you sometimes, after a thorough review, conclude that you can't determine who was at fault? Yes, that's common. So just to put that in another way, in your evaluations, will you come to the conclusion 
that a certain accident is, uh, and the evidence um, that you receive in gathering information about it is uh, not clear enough for you to identify who is responsible for it? Yes. Let's talk about the resp uh, skier responsibility code. You mentioned that. Yes. And it's been brought up before, but since you're the ski expert, let's have you teach us about it for a second. I believe it is defense. Give me just a second, sorry. I thought I had it right here. Yep, it's defense 91. Any objection to that being published? Or I guess I should talk to the judge. No, uh, no objection. <laughs> 91 is received. OK, so let's put this up on the screen. It's also on your screen right there, Mr. Bogger. Yeah, thank you. I see it. And I'll turn it here so it's a little easier to see. OK, so is this the skier responsibility code you were referencing earlier? It is, and it's actually changed in the last a uh, few years, but uh, but that's the one that was in existence at the time of this accident. Okay, got it. 2016. 2016. February. 2016, February, that's correct. Okay, and how do you know about this skier responsibility code? Well, it's key, <clears throat> excuse me, it's key to all of the duties that we were just talking about in order for people, the skiers, for us to do our part. And it's a national code, started back in the 60s with the National Ski Patrol System before they had professional ski patrols at ski areas. And it's used all over North America. Uh, Canada has something called the Alpine Responsibility Code. It's very similar. It has a few more details on it. That it I, I testified in trials in Australia talking about a, a code that they have. Again, very similar to this. But these are basic rules of the road. You have to give people so you can put some order into the chaos that is skiing. You know, skiing is very dynamic, as you know if you're a skier. And so you're trying to put some basic rules in that people can follow their common sense. And, oh, go ahead. Do, do you know, are, are there ways that skiers can become familiar with this responsibility code? Yes, this is uh, published at all ski areas. It's on trail maps, typically. And you'd find them on big trail signboards, too, at the ski area. Websites will have it. There's all sorts of uh, places you can go to find this, but it's it's everywhere. Okay, and um, let's talk about the particular points here. I'll pull them out. Maybe let should we just go through them one by one? Is that okay? Sure. However you want to. Okay, do Okay, so the first one: always stay in control and be able to stop or avoid other people or objects. That seems fairly common sense. Yes, that's, that's, if that one doesn't work, the rest of them aren't going to work. <laughs> and then the second one maybe uh, is more important. People ahead of you have the right of way. It is your responsibility to avoid them. Can you explain what that means for skiers? Yes, and the presumption is when people are skiing down a run, the people in front of you aren't going to have that rear view like you would. You'd, have, you'd be in a better position as an overtaking skier to see the people in front of you. Got it. Um, three is you must not stop where you obstruct a trail or are not visible from above. What does that mean? Well, again, it's just about being visible. And so if there's a break over in the terrain and you were on the bottom side of it, the skier that's coming from above isn't going to see you. And so it's to prevent surprises. And again, if you're skiing in control, if you're following the first rule, when you're coming up to terrain changes, that's one of the things that skiers have to manage is their skiing, their, their speed, their rate, their course, and most importantly, their lookout. That's what allows them, if, even if they come to a terrain change and there's a, let's say a small child taking his skis off on the downside of that hill, you're not going to run into him even though that person might not be following the code you're not following it either if you just go tearing over the, the hill. You have to be able to be in a position to maneuver so you don't hit anything. Okay, so if a skier were uh, taking, are you familiar with the term GS turns? <laughs> yes, giant slalom. If a skier were taking GS turns, what principles 
here should that skier follow? Well, with a GS turn, and again, just backing up for a moment, skiing is very dynamic. It's people that are changing positions relative to each other all the time, and people are going at different speeds. People are using different styles, and you're mentioning one of them, you know, short radius turn or a slalom versus a larger radius turn, more rounded turn, a giant slalom. And these are different styles, and they, there's no prescription for how you have to do it or even what your ability is, any of that. There's no speed limit. I mean, there's slow skiing areas, but there's no number. So the idea is skiers have to be able to be in control, and it's the, the lookout. In a GS turn, you're going, you're taking wider swaths of terrain. You're moving across more, you're using more of the available hill space. So again, if there was trail density that was suggesting maybe you should be skiing shorter radius turns, that would be a reason. Um, but typically when people are skiing uh, giant slalom turns, their speed is usually faster. And people that are skiing short radius turns, I mean, if they try, they can ski quickly, but most of the time it's, the turn is what controls your speed. So if you're making more of them, you're probably going slower. What about, uh, if, let's assume a skier is overtaking another group, they're skiing through a group that's skiing slower, what responsibility does that skier have? Well, again, as the overtaking skier, you're looking at the rule number two, people ahead of you have the right of way, and when you're coming into a group, you now have less space to maneuver, and your lookout has to be sharper because you have more things to focus on. Again, remember, everybody's not moving in unison. They're, they're moving uh, dynamically and, and, and people can turn suddenly. And so again, if you're a prudent skier, and this isn't necessarily covered in the code, but if I'm gonna make an abrupt turn on a crowded run, that's a problem for me. If I didn't look, I need to look up. Uh, you know, it doesn't say you have to look uphill, but so the, the code gets you just so far. And I think, if I may, one of the things about the code is if you try to look at any one rule and say, for example, in a collision, because I have to look at this all the time in these investigations or when I'm training people, I, I would have to tell them, never focus on just one. That's just one part of the puzzle. There's usually something else. And if I had a penny for everything that was involved, the failure of the lookout, for example, if I have two, I might have two skiers in a collision and both are trying to be the, the not the uh, uphill skier. And I look at them and I'm going, but you were changing your positions. You had different speeds. You were merging and converging on each other. You both have the responsibility for your lookout. It can't just be straight ahead. You have to be looking. And that's part of why you have to go to number one. And that's the king. And then you go through the rest of them, but you can't hang your head on just one. Now, in some accidents, it may be uh, really prominent, and you can weight it that way. But I'm just saying, you, you need to consider all of this, and the lookout, yeah. you can't forget. Right, so um, is there anything um, about, uh, what, what can you tell us about the rules of skiing reasonably that relates to skiing within your ability? Is that, is that one of the rules? Well, it's not a rule per se, but it is right here that you have to be in control. So that means for whatever slope you're on, whatever the snow surface might be, it might be a hard, icy day, and you're going faster, it might be a little harder to control your, uh, your speed, you know, you need to then, it, it's not that different, I guess, from driving there, because, you know, if the weather's bad and your braking distance is bad, then you have to give more room. And I think creating space is, is a key, but you have to ski within your ability and you want to assume that maybe not everybody's doing the same thing and, and leave a margin. Okay, that. so what about if, uh, take a, an example of a skier that may, may have certain physical disabilities, does that skier have the responsibility to um, take account of those, disabil or those limitations and ski appropriately? Yes, of course. Um, Let's go move away from this for a second um, and ask you about um, a hypothetical that connects to Dr. Schur's testimony. You were here when Dr. Schur yes. testified earlier, I was. correct? 
and he talked about bindings releasing. Do you remember that? Yes. And do you have knowledge about how bindings release in, a, in ski collisions? Yes, I do. So if you were uh, to assume a certain skier came and hit another skier directly in the back um, at a high rate of speed, um, would you expect bindings to um, come loose, the skis to come off the skier? Objection, Your Honor. Lack of foundation also not contained in his report in the lease. There is nothing mentioning any binding release in anywhere in the report. Sustained. Let's um, let's try take another hypothetical. Give me a second to think it through. Let's forget about bindings and use that same hypothetical of someone skiing directly into someone else's back. Would you expect that person uh, to? Um, launch over the next the, the the person they hit, in, you know, a couple feet down the down the mountain. Same objection, Your Honor. Lack of foundation. Sustained. Is there a space on the hill where? Um, skiers um, where you where you should where you uh, let me think about it differently if a skier were trying to avoid collisions and ski in a kind of safe and cautious place on the hill where should that skier go well you could look for uh, certainly train within your ability and if you want to be cautious you'd probably want to be on uh, easier runs and if you were wanting to be away from more people, specifically if you're concerned about skier collisions and runs are getting crowded these days, you know, you pick, a, you pick the right time or you, you wait for opportunities. You can wait for traffic to go by and then you can go. Uh, staying on the margins of the run uh, is usually good because you only have one side to defend, if you will. So if, if a skier were taking short radius turns on the right side of a run, would, would that be within the um, uh, parameters you've just described? Yes. Uh, I did cut you off a little earlier when you were talking about the inherent risks of skier collisions, the things you learned about what the inherent risks are in skiing, invest investigating collisions. I want to make sure you got out what you wanted to on that point. Was there anything else? Well, I, I mean, that's a, a big question. Objection, big. Sustained. Okay, Your Honor, may I uh, take a second to sure. consult with my counsel? Thanks. Sure. Sure. Bogger. Sure. Um, you personally went to the site of this collision, correct? I did. And were you there when Mr. Brill, uh, maybe I should ask first, do you know Mr. Brian Brill? I do. And uh, who is he? Uh, he does animations, the ones that you've been seeing here, and uh, he, he does them all over uh, 
for ski accidents, I think he does other things too, but he's very, very precise in laying out the terrain and the features in the terrain that, you know, the trees are all the right height and the shadows are correct and all of that. Yeah, and, and you were here and you'd seen the animations before, correct? Objection. I have. Objection, Your Honor. This goes beyond the scope of his report. There's no mention of animations in the report. O overruled at this point. I and you to see what the, how it's tied in. Sure. I was just going to ask that does the, given that you've been to the site of the collision, does the animation to you accurately portray the, the location? Objection, Your Honor. Sustained as to relevance. It doesn't matter. It, it was a demonstrative of the other witness's testimony. Okay. Um, in this case, um, what did you review? I looked at all the uh, deposition testimony, the documents, and various uh, forms. Uh, we, we did the site inspection. Um, I, I did work with Mr. Brill on the animations. Um, I, I talked to Mr. Objection, Your Honor. Graf. Strike. Relevance. Sustained as to relevance. Why don't we take a, our lunch break at this time? It's just a little afternoon. and we'll, So we'll take a recess and return at 1.30. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. questions in light of the court's earlier rulings okay we'll see you back at 1:30 thank you
No, I won't bring them in the room until they're ready. Mr. Bogger, you can come back up to the witness stand. We're ready for the jury. Thank you. Mr. Egan, you may continue. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Bogger, we just have a few more questions and then we'll get you off the stand here. Um, first, uh, it, is it your opinion that both Mr. Sanderson and Ms. Paltrow had the responsibility to exercise reasonable care to avoid a collision with each other on the day of their accident? Yes, that's correct. And if and you're familiar with Miss Paltrow's account of that collision, correct? Yes, I am. Have you heard her testimony in the trial testimony that she gave to this jury? I have. And you also reviewed her deposition. Yes. And uh, if you assume that her account is correct, um, is it your opinion that she did comply with the standard of care or the, the reasonable standard that you, you just said that was her duty? Yes. And if you assume her account was correct, did Mr. Standerson comply with that duty? No. 
and um, why is that? Well, if you assume the facts that we're looking at Ms. Paltrow's version, then you would have to conclude that at the moment of the collision, she was a skier below and was hit from behind. And that collision, I know I said there were a lot of other factors, but in this case, that seems to be the key factor. And that's where the failure of someone's lookout at the last minute, even if they can be in control the entire time, making great slalom turns, whatever it might be, but you can be a very good skier and you can be skiing in control, but if you have a momentary failure and there is someone below you of your lookout, then you have a collision. And by definition, if you have that collision, that's not in control because you can't stop and avoid anything below. So by definition, that's skiing out of control, even if it's momentary. Did you review the evidence relating to Deer Valley's um, paperwork and um, obtaining of information about this accident? I did. And do you have knowledge of the standards for ski resorts in terms of that kind of a um, investigation of an accident? Yes. And did Deer Valley comply with that standard? Yes, based on the facts that they had in front of them, yes. And did you see any evidence of um, inappropriate documentation? No. What I reviewed looked like it would meet the industry standard of care. It would be very similar to all the ski areas that I visited and, and know I'm familiar with their record keeping and so forth. These are typical business records kept in the course of business. In your experience, thoroughly investigating over, I think you said, 500 ski collisions, do you sometimes conclude that the evidence does not allow you to determine who is at fault? All the time, yeah. You, sometimes you just don't have enough information, sometimes you have conflicting information, and you just, you know, there's plausible versions, and you can't, you can't know which one's right, and you just have to realize that you're not going to be able to determine fault, so that's, that's common enough. Okay, that's all my questions, thanks. Thanks. Ms. Van Orman. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm going to be really, really quick with you. In fact, we're just going to do the opposite of what you just testified to. So you were just asked if Ms. Paltrow's version of the accident, assuming that was true, would Mr. Sanderson have violated the skier's responsibility code? We're going to flip that. You've heard Mr. Sanderson and Mr. Ramon's version of the accident. Assuming those were true, they would have complied with the skier's responsibility code, correct? Correct. And Ms. Paltrow would have violated the, the skier's responsibility code. That's correct. All right. And in fact, the skier's responsibility code, it applies to all skiers. They all have to follow it, right? That's correct. No matter if somebody has a disability in their eye or if they're turning to look at their children to watch them ski. All skiers have that responsibility at all times. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Egan? That's all, Your Honor. Thank you. And Mr. Bogger? Thank you. You may step down. Mr. Egan, you may call your next witness, or Mr. Owens this time. Thank you. Stephen Edgley, MD. So, Dr. Edgley, the court wants to uh, swear you to tell the truth. There's a lot of stuff here. Do you swear that the testimony you are about to give in the case now before the court will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So, help you, God. Thank you. You can have a seat. Good afternoon. Would you begin by stating your full name and spelling it for the jury? Yes. Stephen or Edgley. Uh, that's a S-T-E-V-E-N-E-D-G-L-E-Y. -E -E Thank you. Yep. Okay, 
Dr. Edsley, are you employed? Yes. Where are you employed? At the uh, University of Utah. And uh, <clears throat> are you over the Acquired Brain Injury Division? Yes. Uh, physical Medicine and Rehab is uh, my specialty, and uh, I'm uh, over uh, uh, that uh, sec section. How yes. old are you, sir? Uh, 49. Okay, and just background, undergraduate <clears throat> degree, where was that? I uh, stu uh, studied uh, psychology with uh, a pre-med emphasis at uh, BYU. Um, my med school training was in Chicago at Loyola University in Chicago. And I did a four-year residency in physical medicine and rehab at the University of Utah. And then did you go there? Did you stay at the university? Yes. And have been for how many years? Um, uh, overall, 20, 20, yes. Okay, and do you, do you hold an endowed chair at the university? I do. Do you teach? Are you a professor there? I do. And you personally had an acquired brain injury, is that true? Uh, yes. So I uh, had a stroke in 2001, um, 21 years ago. And uh, did that event play a role in your area of study? He did. Um, I uh, was uh, initially uh, matched uh, for a residency uh, training in ophthalmology, actually. Um, I uh, took uh, one year off uh, to uh, um, deal with uh, the recovery aspects of uh, my stroke and, uh, and then uh, began physical medicine and rehab residency uh, training. Are you board certified in your specialty? I am. Uh, you are a physician MD, correct? Yes. And um, do you deal with people other than stroke people, other acquired brain injuries? So um, in my uh, practice, uh, so I, it's a very busy uh, practice. Um, 95% of uh, my practice deals with acquired brain injury. And what is that as opposed, as opposed to brain injury? Like if a baby is born with a brain injury, that's it's not acquired, not right? acquired. So uh, uh, acquired uh, brain injury uh, encompasses strokes, uh, uh, traumatic brain injury concussions and um, a myriad of uh, other uh, brain injuries uh, related uh, to you know surgery um, anoxia uh, near drownings anoxia is like oxygen deprivation yes okay like it and maybe a a child who's found at the bottom of a swimming pool, rehabilitated, brought in, and they come and see you? Yes. Uh, about how many patients have you seen uh, in your career? So I, I have, let's see, uh, um, I see about 15 separate encounters per day over 20 years. Uh, that uh, equals over 65,000 patient encounters of acquired brain injury. Thank you. And have, uh, do you consider yourself an expert in brain injuries? Yes. And the fact that you have personally had, and the fact that you have personally had, will give you additional insight. It uh, makes me. Uh, um, uh, kind of a uh, unique uh, and that I have uh, experienced 
Yes. Have you reviewed voluminous records in this case? I have. So the court complaint, uh, records and reports from the VA hospital, is that fair? Yes. About a thousand pages or so? Yes. And uh, deposition transcripts, Gwyneth Paltrow, Terry Sanderson, uh, the daughters, Sam Goldstein, Dr. Fong, all of those? Yes, uh, that's correct. Yes. And medical records also of the Park City Instacare, Cognitive FX, Sam Goldstein. Have you reviewed those? Yes. Uh, do you believe that you have uh, the foundation to render expert opinions in this case? I do. The jurors have already heard that the patient, uh, or I should say Mr. Sanderson, has um, a mild traumatic brain injury. Do you agree or disagree? I, uh, I think uh, I have a poured over uh, the uh, records. Um, I, I think uh, it's possible. Okay. But uh, the uh, testimonies are inconclusive. Did you tell me that uh, the most important things you look at are how long they're unconscious and how long they've lost their memory, amnesia? Uh, that's correct. So uh, uh, that's uh, going by uh, the Cantu Concussion Grading System, which is uh, preferable because it's uh, the most objective and not uh, relying on subjective um, symptoms uh, from uh, any patient. Okay, so a concussion, if, so, if you hear someone has a concussion, are those that your two lead questions? How long were you out? And how long is your memory out? Exactly. All right, and apply that to Mr. Sanderson, would you? So it is uh, unclear whether he lost consciousness. Now, um, uh, let me, me uh, be uh, clear. So um, let's uh, define con uh, consciousness. So uh, when you are unconscious, you are totally lifeless and limp not speaking, not moving, uh, that's unconsciousness. Uh, I, uh, I uh, based on uh, the records, uh, there is a, a very inconsistent evidence uh, that uh, he did, in fact, lose consciousness. So I, I am not able to uh, state uh, that uh, conclusively. Okay. What do we know about, for instance, uh, Christensen was the ski instructor. He testified n to no loss of consciousness. Are you with me? Yep. And uh, Brad Falchuk has not gone yet. Ms. Paltrow has uh, Paltrow has stated no loss of consciousness. Craig Ramon did say loss of consciousness. Have I sort of summarized some of the people who talked about that? Yeah, and uh, the uh, plaintiff uh, uh, himself has uh, said, uh, you know, loss of consciousness um, five minutes, and then uh, again uh, a later 10 minutes. Okay, yes. so Mr. Sanderson kept changing yes. what he was telling people, right? Uh, I don't know, a few seconds, five yes. minutes, and then 10 minutes, true? Yes, and I, th I think uh, that is uh, why it's uh, important uh, to clarify 
loss of consciousness with the, uh, the post-traumatic amnesia. So, um, so uh, the plaintiff will not remember how long he was unconscious, if at all. He will remember uh, the first uh, memory he had of uh, that event. Okay. And so consciousness, I heard you say five minutes, and I just want to be clear. Uh, one of the ways we rate uh, sort of the severity of the concussion is um, very short to no concussion, up to five minutes, and then over five minutes. So is that uh, true? So uh, uh, to uh, clarify, no loss of the consciousness, but uh, post-traumatic amnesia is a, a grade one concussion. Thank you. Uh, Whitney Smith, I guess, was another provider who said no loss of consciousness. Do you, are you aware of that testimony? I, I, um, I, I, I don't uh, recall. Okay, yes. Whitney was the toboggan person. Yeah, and she, okay. She asked, a, a, she quizzed them, I guess, but let, let me move on. Okay, so uh, even under, even if Ramon's testimony is believed, uh, that that would put him only in the second category, less than five minutes? Yes. Okay, and first category is essentially no loss of consciousness. Yes. Okay, now let's go to amnesia. Applying what you've learned about Mr. Sanderson, how long was his uh, amnesia after oh. the collision? Uh, that is also a very ambiguous and uh, multiple re reports. I, so um, I, I uh, hear and uh, read uh, that uh, he had uh, a conversation with uh, uh, Eric Christensen, which he does remember, you know, which uh, was, uh, you know, uh, traumatic in his uh, opinion. So Sanderson remembers Christensen yelling at him. True? So... Is that what you're referring to? Yes. Uh, that is uh, the allegation, yes. Okay. And uh, he, he remembers his friend, uh, Craig Ramon, talking to him. Are you okay? Are you okay? True? Yes. Okay. So what does that tell you about, like, length of amnesia? Um, it was brief, if at all. Okay. So you said the two big things we look at for severity of concussion is uh, how long they're out and how long they can forget things. Um, yes. And um, I will add... Um, So, um, people uh, experiencing a brain uh, trauma have uh, a period of uh, fogginess, and, and uh, as uh, the plaintiff himself uh, said, uh, quote, I rung my bell. I rung, okay. At one point he said, I had... I rung my bell. I hear you. Go ahead. So uh, I am not uh, able to uh, say, you know. So, so. Um, it is uh, pr probably, uh, it is likely uh, that uh, he did have uh, some uh, confusion, but, uh, but if, if he had no loss of consciousness right. and no post-traumatic amnesia 
uh, they can't really uh, be uh, called a concussion. All right, fair enough. And confusion, let's just talk about that issue. Um, he has memories at the actual incident site, correct? I, I suppose. Uh, I, I don't I think. Objection. Doctor, you, that's when you do not answer. Uh, length of um, period of confusion. Do you remember what he told the toboggan person, uh, Whitney, uh, about whether he, do you know if what Whitney observed in terms of his confusion level? No. Okay. Um, she, she wrote oh, alert and oriented times four or something. Uh, that's in evidence. I'm asking him now to comment on it. Overruled. No foundation. Overruled. If Miss, uh, if Whitney, the toboggan person, observed no conf uh, alert and oriented times four, are you familiar with that term? Yes. And how, is it four out of four? Yes. Like four is the best score. Yeah. I'm just, yeah. I I want to know what that scale means. Please tell me. So. Uh, Let's see, yeah, oriented uh, to a person, please, uh, situation and, and uh, location. Please, time? Uh, time, I yes. Don't I don't know, okay. Uh, person, please, time, uh, situation. Did you say president or present? No. Person. Person. So, person. So, gotcha. So, uh, all right. And the I, jury's heard on those issues, so uh, that's okay. I asked Terry, uh, would it surprise you if at the Instacare they found no confusion? He said no. Uh, is that consistent with your knowledge of the events? Yes. Have you seen texts he was sending out even at the bottom of the hill about Whitney? I, Go ahead. I have uh, heard about uh, uh, the uh, text, yes. All right. Uh, Is it your opinion that uh, if, if Mr. Sanderson suffered a concussion and it was mild, it leading. was mild? Leading. That's o overruled? Go ahead. Uh, uh, what's uh, the question yes. again? Is it, is it your opinion that if Mr. Sanderson suffered a concussion, it was mild? Yeah, it, yes, it is. Yeah. And is that based on the things we've been discussing, or are there any other issues? Um, Loss of consciousness, amnesia, confusion. Yeah. I'm just wondering, are there other issues we ought to hit before we move on to your next opinion that go to that issue? A helmeted low velocity impact. Uh, also, low velocity impact. What does that mean? So, uh, so he uh, was not uh, going fast. Okay, what do you like? Know? Like uh, in a car accident. Uh, he was not uh, going car speeds. Okay. And you read, for instance, the depositions where they discuss it was actually kind of a slow fall. Yes. And that's important when determining how hard the hit was or something for the concussion severity. Yes. Thank you. Any other factors we've missed? I don't think so. All right. Let's go to your second opinion here. None of the medical records support plaintiff's claim that perceived symptoms of cognitive decline are related to the ski collision. Is that your opinion? Yes. Maybe I'll is. flip it around. Comment on the his symptoms uh, 
What, what percentage of his symptoms that he now complains of are related to the ski collision? Uh, I, I can't uh, really do with that. Uh, I, I think um, it would be uh, uh, better uh, to um, analyze what uh, he had uh, going on in his, in his brain before and after uh, the collision. Please do that. So um, uh, the uh, plaintiff, and I am in no way uh, trying to uh, pick on uh, the uh, plaintiff, uh, but uh, he had a number of uh, brain conditions. Um, he had a stroke, uh, which uh, he lost uh, he has uh, eyesight in his right eye. Stroke. Yes. Um, he had um, uh, evidence of a microvascular disease. In his brain? Uh, in his uh, brain. Um, and uh, most, um, probably uh, most importantly, he had evidence of a hydrocephalus uh, clear back in 2009. And um, a lot, so uh, uh, let me uh, talk about uh, the hydrocephalus. Uh, and okay, let me make sure we get the whole list though. These are preceding brain problems from his uh, pre collision true Your yeah Honor, are, we, are we showing this whatever this exhibit is to the witness and having him read off of that no he's not reading off of it but please turn it around it's a different topic go ahead so um, that was not a prop that was getting ready to show it, but we'll we'll go on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, would you state? Yes. Uh, thank that, you. Uh, okay. I heard you say, uh, with regard to pre-collision brain problems that the plaintiff had: stroke, microvascular disease, hydrocephalus. Any others? Um, not that uh, showed up on uh, the. MRI of his brain in all nine. He had a history of migraines. Is that something you'd put under that list or not? Yeah. Yes. So. Sustained. Okay. Um, Pardon me. I didn't even strike. I, I couldn't hear. Just move to strike the answer. Motion granted. I didn't even know what his answer was going to be. By the way. I'm just trying to get this list together, but so the answer is true. The jury should, uh, must disregard it. Thank you. So, uh, if you think of another one, we ought to talk about. Please tell me, okay? Uh, uh, you said you want to talk about hydrocephalus. What is that word? Hydrocephalus is uh, uh, where uh, the uh, ventricles have. Uh, um, too much uh, pressure, or, or um, a, a condition uh, called normal pressure hydrocephalus, which uh, is equally uh, a kind of a devastating. Um, you it down for me. Does hydro mean water? Yes. What does cephalus mean? Uh, brain. Okay, yeah. so. Uh, water on the brain. And then this is very confusing. Normal so, pressure hydrocephalus is not a normal condition. Is that true? Not, not at all. Over, overruled? It's, I mean, when I see the word normal in a diagnosis, I think, oh, that's normal. But in this case, normal pressure hydrocephalus is or is not a a good condition. So, um, it is a well recognized medical condition uh, that is degenerative 
in nature, meeting it uh, gets worse with time. About one, only one in 500 uh, people uh, between uh, the age 60, 60 and 70 have this, and it uh, gets worse with that time. You said hydrocephalus means water brain. What does so, that mean? There's too much fluid in the head, or what? You so uh, it uh, specifically uh, means that the, uh, there is uh, too much uh, fluid in the ventricles of uh, the brain. And what's a ventricle again? Um, so uh, fluid uh, field um, uh, cavities uh, that uh, feed uh, the uh, uh, spinal column mm. and uh, eventually uh, get uh, resorbed uh, by uh, the body. And you said it's progressive, just comment on that. So let's say there were no ski accident. Comment on its progressiveness in Mr. Sanderson. So uh, it's been 14 years uh, since uh, that initial MRI. Um, so uh, that's quite a bit, a, a bit of uh, time. Uh, I would expect symptoms uh, to uh, crop up like loss of a memory, mm. like uh, trouble uh, with balance. Okay. Let's move on to microvascular disease. By the way, was I want to know if these things are related. If someone has uh, the hydrocephalus like Mr. Sanderson, does he also have to have microvascular disease? No. All right. And do you believe the microvascular disease caused the stroke? Yes. Okay, so those two things are related. So go ahead. Uh, so a stroke of uh, the central retinal artery is a harbinger of feature strokes and a indication that uh, uh, there is micro uh, microvascular disease. So microvascular. Micro means small. Is that right? Yes. Vascular means like blood flow? Yes. All right, so small blood flow. So in lay terms, um, does that mean the passages of blood flow are narrowed in his brain? Yes. I, I, Sustained? I, I'm trying to get to the most like eighth or grade level, which is what I understand. Yeah. So comment uh, on on. Mr. Sanderson's pre-collision brain as it related to microvascular disease, please. So, uh, two um, points. So, um, some uh, microvascular disease uh, can cause a uh, very small stroke, um, which are um, not able to uh, be detected by uh, scans, MRI, CT. Also, uh, a number two, uh, um, microvascular disease uh, is a um, great uh, risk factor for a feature stroke. Do you believe this, uh, is, is this your opinion, all symptoms the plaintiff claims is explained not by the collision, but by his pre-accident conditions. We, I'm trying to get his opinion out there, Your Honor. You can ask what his opinion is. Yeah, uh, sustained. Okay, comment on your opinion on, on that issue, on the issue of his, his current claims as it relates to his um, pre-accident conditions? So, <clears throat> uh, 
in a more likely than not scenario. Uh, in this 76 year old brain now uh, concussion symptoms should only last for one to three months there is a wide berth of the evidence uh, that when the concussion symptoms last for longer than uh, three months, it's highly correlated with monetary gains or litigation. Explain that, please. Monetary gains or litigation. Go ahead. And relate it, please, directly to Mr. Sanderson. Yeah. Your Honor, this goes beyond the scope of his expert report. Could you approach, please? sustained Describe the answer to and the answer question and answer will be stricken and the jury is ordered to disregard it comment would you on the patient's pre-existing anxiety and depression So, <clears throat> he ha has uh, been medicated uh, uh, for a number of uh, years uh, for depression and anxiety. And do you believe those things play a role in his current condition? Absolutely. And just comment on that, would you? So, <clears throat> also, uh, when uh, symptoms of concussion last for three months or longer, uh, anxiety and depression and other psychiatric conditions uh, uh, are uh, the likely cause of uh, that prolongation. The last sentence. Uh, I, I missed the last word. I'm sorry. Uh, prolongation. Prolongation. Yes. Thank you for explaining that. Can you just comment just a little further about that? What do you say it a different way for me? Would you? Yeah. So, um, have the symptoms of a concussion should last no more than three months. When uh, the symptoms of concussion last longer than three months, you start looking for, and uh, this is high, highly correlated with underlining 
depression, anxiety, and other psychiatric uh, conditions. One thing you noted in your report was plaintiff has a history of seeking medical attention at an abnormal rate, 72 times in 10 years. Is that your opinion? Leading. Sustained. Well, comment on how frequently uh, Mr. Sanderson went to his doctors in the 10 years prior to the collision. So I did uh, note uh, that uh, he had a, an extensive uh, history of uh, seeking care. And yes. what does that tell you? Why is that important? Um, uh, two things. One, uh, uh, either he, he has many medical issues uh, before uh, the uh, collision, or he is uh, kind of hyper focused on uh, his symptoms. And that's pre collision we're talking about? Yes. And then pre collision. Uh, just as a part of aging, did he note a decline in his mental or physical activity, acuity level? So, <clears throat> what's interesting uh, um, is within one month of uh, uh, the uh, collision, uh, he uh, uh, went to uh, his uh, own family doctor and said, I'm, I feel like I'm getting old. This is within one month before, correct? Yes. And did he say, I'm having a hard time doing the things I've always done? Yes. Bleeding. Overruled. And uh, why, was he f why was he feeling that way? Do we know? Uh, I yeah so I, I I'm just asking do you have any thoughts on that issue sustained well using your medical opinion I'm just wondering uh, what does that tell you as a reviewing medical expert foundation overruled go ahead I'm getting uh, old and I can't do what I used to do Go ahead. He so overruled. Go ahead. So I have uh, had many patients of uh, his age say uh, the same thing. Yes, um, and I I think um, it's important to, to uh, clarify one thing. So. Um, the brain is an organ, just like any other organ. With time, it accrues conditions, problems, just like any other organ. Uh, now the uh, plaintiff had uh, evidence uh, including objective evidence of on uh, MRI and uh, uh, things like that of uh, this uh, these uh, disease processes before uh, the clinician. Okay, and this was the stroke workup. Is that where he had the imaging? Yeah. Before, and. Uh, do you know of any of their plaintiff's experts who actually reviewed the stroke imaging before the collision? Foundation, you're on. Overruled? I do. Uh, did they? Um, did any of the plaintiff's experts review the imaging to your knowledge? Not uh, to my knowledge. And if we're trying to figure out, hey, what's this guy's brain like before and what's this brain, guy's brain like after, it would be nice to put those side to side, wouldn't it? And actually compare. 
yield word and uh, yeah, that, uh, that's uh, what uh, the defense has done, yes. All right, let's just talk about aging. Direct. Uh, have you seen... May I show him a document, Your Honor? Before I publish it? Sure. Have you seen Defense Exhibit 103 and 103B? I have. And does that appear to be a true and correct summary of Mr. Sanderson's health before the incident? It does. Okay, and Your Honor, I move to publish it. Any objection? We object, Your Honor. It's, it's what we've talked about before. There's irrelevant medical information there. I'm about to establish the, re the relevance. If he hasn't established it yet. Um, I'm going to admit 103 and 103B at, for demonstrative purposes only to, to allow this witness to illustrate their testimony. Is this okay for a minute? Sure. This is the same thing, I just don't trust technology. So 103, uh, and doctor, do you have a binder right in front of you? Yeah. May, may I approach? Oh, can you see it right here? Yes. Oh. The monitor, it threw us the first week that the monitor wasn't working. Can, can we do the first uh, third? All right. Uh, can you see that okay, doctor? Yes. And is this the, the note you were just talking about? Thinks he's gotten old all of a sudden, not doing things he used to do? Yeah, uh, it is, yes. And then uh, let's stay that big. Then. Blind and right eye, were you familiar with that? I was. And severely impaired in the other, did you see that in his medical records? I did. Uh, did you see evidence that he walked into walls before the incident? Yes. He would ask people standing on the right side of his field of vision to move so that he could see them. Uh, did you see that in the evidence? Yes. One of the reasons he retired was because he had a stroke event that deprived his ox eye of oxygen, impacting his vision. Uh, did you observe that in the evidence? Yes. If we're going to go through all these, it's going to be leading, Your Honor, every time. O overruled. He, he adjusted his skiing at w to one side of the slope to try to avoid hitting others in his blind spot. Did you observe that? Yes. He had to be picky about what days he skied to avoid days with lighting that would further limit his depth perception. Uh, do you agree? Uh, did you see that in the evidence? Yes. By the way, I mean, if I, if I close one eye, do I have depth perception? Is it still three, uh, comment on that. Is it still three-dimensional or is it now two-dimensional? You do want to have yeah. so his expert testimony, Your Honor. It's commenting about aging. Overruled. Okay, so I'm closing one eye. Does that hurt my depth perception or it doesn't? That does. Just comment very briefly. Well, um, uh, you have uh, basically uh, got a monocular uh, situation. Uh, and so uh, depth uh, perception will, will be uh, severely impaired. Prostate cancer, uh, were you aware he, he, to this day, still has metastatic prostate cancer? Yes. It's not like it was cured, true? Yeah. And he is severely hearing impaired. Did you see that in the record? Yes. He has difficulty hearing higher frequency sounds like a woman's voice. Did you see that? Yes. Hearing loss is severe. Did you see that? Yes. Heart, 
palpitations. Did you see reference to that? Yes. And he was on two heart medicines, two heart, uh, at the, just prior to the ski collision, two blood pressure meds for his heart? Yes. Is that, is that related to the palpitations or are those high blood pressure issues separate from the palpitations? So, um, <clears throat> uh, they can be related uh, to uh, the heart, uh, they uh, can be related uh, to uh, anxiety. Okay. Do you have an opinion one way or the I, other? Uh, so, I cannot speculate. Okay. Mr. Sanderson is 76 years old and experiencing the effects of aging. Do you believe that? Uh, you Doug. We all are. Is that a yes? Uh, yes. Microvascular disease, we talked about that. Moderate diffuse volume loss atrophy. Brain volume decreasing. In, did you note that, that he had that prior to the ski collision? So uh, I read it down on uh, the report, yes. Okay. And what does that mean? It, do our brains all shrink as we age? Yes, um, some more than others. And talk, talk about Mr. Sanderson, please. Uh, brain atrophy yeah, can be uh, caused by a number of, of uh, factors. Okay. Comment on Mr. Sanderson, please. Um, why did he have that before the ski collision? Uh, we don't. That's why I know why he had it before. I'm oh, oh. If he knows it. Overruled. Tell us if you know why he he had it. I I don't. Uh, uh, it's a vague uh, symptom uh, finding, and uh, it uh, could uh, be uh, caused by a number of uh, things. Uh, Commonly, uh, people who uh, drink alcohol ex excessively uh, commonly uh, have brain atrophy. But uh, but uh, there are a number of uh, um, other causes. Did you see uh, any evidence in the VA record that he sometimes drinks more than six drinks a night? I did. And they. Did you see his, the advice from his providers was, don't do that anymore. I did. We want you to abstain from alcohol. Yes? Overruled. I did uh, see that, yes. All right, uh, we're gonna move faster here. By the way, it says moderate volume loss. So mild, moderate, severe are those sort of the three categories? Yes. And um, that's uh, referring to uh, the MRI in 2009. Retinal artery occlusion. We talked about that. That's the eye thing. And clotting in arteries delivering blood to brain. Is there anything you want to comment that you haven't talked about on that issue number nine? No, okay. I don't, I don't think so. Depression, you've talked about that. Anything more you want to say about it? Uh, depression and anxiety. Okay. Uh, if he says, since the ski collision, I've had more depression and anxiety than I did before, uh, what do you attribute that to? So, any symptoms past three months, I would uh, attribute it uh, to uh, this uh, uh, multiple Factor is not out the uh, accident. Okay, migraine we've talked about. Let's go. We're going to march through these very fast. In addition to uh, going now, starting on 103B12, did you know he had degenerative disc disease in his back prior to the ski collision? 
I did. Did you see reference to a foot drop that he, at least for a time, he actually was dragging his foot? I did. Weakness in his uh, back and spine? Yes. Loss of sensation, did you see that? Yes. And just general back pain? Did yes. You see that? Knee injury, yes? Yes. And that was actually from a ski collision? Do you recall this? Not a collision, a ski accident? I uh, did not uh, know of that, yes. Shoulder injury, shoulder problems, do you recall him having those? Yes. And hamstring injury, right torn hamstring? Yes. Osteoarthritis, did you see that? Yes. And what um, may be more relevant uh, to uh, this uh, case is uh, the osteoarthritis in uh, the neck uh, region, uh, which would make uh, moving uh, your head side uh, to side kind of uh, painful or difficult. Uh, that, along with uh, the uh, vision impairment, um, uh, are, I think, relevant. All right. Uh, my partner's here are telling me I should wind up. Uh, can you at least look at insomnia, respiratory problems, poor male, sexual reproductive health, lower urinary tract issues, kidney problems, hypercholesterolemia, weight gain, and restless legs? Are those all conditions you saw in his pre-collision medical records? Yeah. And why, why are these things important well, when we're so, talking about aging? Uh, it is a, a long list. Uh, some of uh, the, uh, these uh, conditions are more relevant uh, than others, Fair but enough. but uh, the some um, indicates uh, that uh, he is seventy six, and with uh, seventy six year olds. Sometimes I have multiple uh, medical conditions like this. And these were all pre-collision events, right? Pre-collision co conditions. Yes. And what does that tell you in terms of his, his aging, like at 69? Well, um, that he was? So I, like I said uh, before, we all are. Aging. Uh, yes. And uh, there, so in terms of uh, the brain as an organ, organ uh, we uh, talk about brain reserve. And we talk about cognitive reserve. Brain reserve can set you a go down and down, uh, starting at around uh, age of 25. Uh, it uh, goes down faster uh, with uh, time and aging. Okay. Uh, cognitive reserve uh, indicates uh, that the patient's ability to cope, adapt, be resilient, and find effective workarounds for that brain decline, which we all, all uh, are uh, undergoing at various stages. Let me conclude here. They're about to stand up and criticize you for not personally meeting with the patient. Did you personally meet with Mr. Sanderson? 
No. And what did his tre- actual treating providers at the University of Utah, or excuse me, the VA, Veterans Administration people, what did they show on their all their neuropsych testing? So I, I did not press to um, actually meet and examine uh, the plaintiff uh, because I think it uh, would uh, be a kind of a condescending uh, to him and also uh, to me uh, to uh, go over a totally normal physical exam uh, as uh, uh, the uh, um, medical doctors at the, at the VA had well documented records. And they, of, norm, they documented high average to superior in essentially all categories? Sustained. Uh, can you comment on their findings in terms of some kind of graph? So uh, I think uh, you're referring to uh, the neuropsych test. Correct. Just give us, uh, and then I'm sitting down, give yeah. us a couple, two sentences on that, would you? So uh, a neuropsych test is really... Uh, like an MRI of uh, the actual mind and its function. And what was it as to Mr. Sanderson after the collision? Uh, he had uh, three uh, neuropsych tests and uh, it was sup- uh, superior uh, to uh, above average. Thank you. And those are all my questions. Thanks. We'll take a short recess right now. Thank you. Step down, we'll take a 10 minute break. 10 minutes.
your peers and those of your specialty into the actual definition of what unconscious means? I don't think so. <clears throat> so all of those that are in your specialty would say that a loss of consciousness um, involves, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but lifeless and limp is the way you put it. Is that correct? Yes. So if we've heard testimony before this that you can be unconscious or have a loss of consciousness but still be somewhat awake, just disoriented or not alert, that's not correct. Uh, that's disorientation, not a loss of that consciousness. Okay. <clears throat> Is it possible that the amnesia that uh, you talked about with defense counsel is or could account for Terry Sanderson's inconsistent testimony about how long he may or may not have lost consciousness? Yes. Okay. So that is a that is a very real possibility in this case. Yeah, actually, uh, you cannot comment on your own unconsciousness. Gotcha. So, so then we would be forced to rely on the testimony of those that were there or those that reported what they had seen? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> okay. We've heard some testimony earlier uh, about a triggering event. Are you aware of things that could be considered a triggering event? Uh, the uh, concept, yes. Okay. <clears throat> Is Alzheimer's disease caused by a triggering event typically? No. Okay. Is dementia caused by a triggering event? No. Okay. Is NPH caused by a triggering event? No. Okay. Can the presence of NPH exacerbate a concussion or the symptoms of it? Uh, it uh, can in theory, uh, but only uh, for a brief period of a, a time, brief meaning weeks to months, okay. not certainly uh, not seven years. And the jury's heard a lot of testimony about a condition called PCS or post-concussive symptoms. Uh, are you aware of that condition? Yes. <clears throat> so is it your testimony that the presence of NPH could not be a risk factor in possibly leading to PCS? Let me uh, back up. So, um, Uh, you should uh, be uh, aware, if uh, you're not uh, already, uh, that uh, the uh, DSM-5, uh, which is uh, the list of psychiatric conditions, um, uh, the fifth and most uh, current condition uh, says uh, that if a concussion lasts uh, uh, more than three months, um, look for other causes, and and I uh, I believe uh, that uh, they have uh, totally eliminated PCS from uh, that uh, their a diagnostic manual. So, and I don't want to misstate your the answer you just gave me, but is it your opinion then that PCS and NPH are not related at all then? Yeah. 
you're at, uh, asking me uh, to uh, state a categorical answer. Yes, no. Uh, I cannot say that uh, there is no small, you know, uh, association. Okay, so when Dr. Bame, for instance, testifies that it's rare, but PCS can occur after the occurrence of a concussion, is, is that accurate of testimony? I would uh, like to, uh, so I, I uh, have an issue uh, with uh, the term PCS uh, be, because uh, I don't think uh, it's, so where as it was a valid condition, uh, it's not uh, uh, at least in uh, the psychiatric world, it's uh, not recognized as, as a condition now. Okay, so, and, and maybe I inartfully asked the question, but <coughs> essentially if I hear what you're asking or what, what your response was, and again, I don't want to restate for you, but you're, you're coming at this from a psychiatric perspective where PCS might be more of a clinical or medical diagnosis? Is that correct? No. Okay. <clears throat> Can anxiety and depression be uh, risk factors for possibly having PCS? Uh, again, I, I cannot take issue uh, with uh, the uh, term PCS, post-concussion. Syndrome. Okay, what about, and, and I think we're talking about the same things, but I, I believe I'm talking about post-concussion -concuss symptoms, and they, I don't know that they refer to it as syndrome anymore. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so if uh, you want to uh, talk about uh, post-concussion symptoms, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we uh, can uh, have uh, a dialogue. Yes. Okay. Uh, and then, and maybe that's my my fault for misstating it before. Uh, I'll ask you the same question then. Can NPH be a risk factor for post-concussive concussive symptoms? So, <clears throat> NPH is a chronic degenerative uh, disease that uh, um, is likely uh, exacerbated by uh, a number of uh, uh, things. Uh, the Im uh, immediate after aftermath of concussion being one of them. But more likely, much more likely uh, than not, uh, the concussion Symptoms would have long, you know, years ago gone away, and what we're left with is uh, a brain that has uh, NPH, microvascular disease, history of stroke, and is. 76. Okay. And, and you said a history of stroke. I want to make sure the jury's clear. Uh, Mr. Sanderson had a stroke-like event in his eye. Is that what you're referring to when you say stroke? Uh, let me uh, be uh, clear to uh, the jury. So um, uh, the American uh, Stroke and a Heart Association um, considers a, um, a uh, retinal uh, retino artery occlusion as a stroke event. Yes, not a stroke-like event, a stroke. Okay, but there's no uh, scans, and you've poured over many in this case, that show any sort of brain bleed or, or uh, 
any issues besides the MPH and other issues that we've talked about uh, that would be related to that stroke event. Is that correct? Yes. <clears throat> and did you read anywhere uh, in the medical records that you poured over uh, that he had any sort of NPH symptomology before uh, the ski crash in 2016. NPH symptoms are insidious at onset. Okay, and what are, what are those? I think they're called the triads sometimes. What are the three main symptoms of NPH? So, uh, uh, this is a, a very layman's uh, uh, way of explaining it, but uh, you have cognitive deficits, uh, including memory loss. Uh, you have imbalance, and uh, that uh, again uh, lead to uh, falls. And uh, you have uh, urinary incontinence, incontinence uh, loss of uh, uh, the uh, function of uh, holding urine in your bladder. So just to recap, those, those, the triad is, is memory issues, ataxia, and then incontinence is typically how that's diagnosed, correct? Yes. <clears throat> okay. And you did not see any of those symptoms in Mr. Sanderson uh, before the ski crash in 2016? Uh, f before uh, 2009. And what were those symptoms that you read? Well, it's, no, uh, before uh, 2009, uh, that's uh, correct. But uh, yet it was uh, commented on uh, the MRI of a 2009, and uh, given uh, that uh, those symptoms are insidious uh, in uh, their onset, happening over years, maybe a dec uh, decades, uh, 14 years later, uh, uh, I, I'm not at all surprised uh, to uh, find uh, 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 the plaintiff experiencing memory and uh, loss of uh, balance issues. Okay. Did you review uh, any of the MRIs taken of his brain in 2017 after the collision? Yes. And did those MRIs that you reviewed, did those show any sort of a worsening of this NPH? Um, they uh, commented on it. Uh, I, I don't know uh, if uh, the um, scan showed worsening. Okay, so you don't know one way or another if it worsened or not, but they did mention that it, it, that condition was present. Yes. And um, that uh, NPH is a clinical diagnosis verified by rail, uh, radiology findings. But nobody had diagnosed his P, uh, NPH before as having the triad that we talked about before, correct? Uh, I, I do not see any mansion uh, yes okay. <clears throat> and you were asked a lot about uh, plaintiff's medical conditions we had a board up here we had a whole list here um, did you read anywhere in the depositions that you reviewed that any of the laundry list of medical uh, medical issues that the plaintiff may or may not have had before the event kept him from being uh, world traveler or on the go or even skiing that day? The fact that um, 
three weeks earlier, um, he said uh, to his primary care physician, I feel like I'm getting old. That is most likely based on, uh, as you said it, uh, that longer laundry list of conditions. Uh, they're taxing. Uh, there, uh, no one uh, condition is uh, that um, uh, problematic, but uh, the complication of uh, those uh, various conditions do weigh on uh, a person both physically and psychologically. Sure, sure. <clears throat> but then if, if that is the case, doctor, how do you, you reviewed some of the daughter's depositions, as you said, how do you account for their accounts of what happened with their dad directly after the ski crash in 2016? I'm uh, not uh, going to uh, make up a uh, cl claim uh, that uh, there was not a transient decrease of function up to uh, three months. But uh, beyond uh, three months at time, what uh, decline he had uh, was more likely than not already uh, the ball was already rolling okay <clears throat> you testified earlier that you've been an expert in, in many uh, cases that have gone on to litigation do you remember when you testified of that yes have any of those cases been ski uh, crash cases No. Okay. So this is your first uh, ski crash related expert testimony. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Do you know what confabulation is? Yes. And what is that? Will you explain it for the jury, please? Uh, confabulation uh, means Make, uh, making this information up. And it's, it's not just lying per se, right? It's not just you're grabbing it out of thin air. There's a little bit more of a, a clinical uh, definition for it. Isn't that correct? Uh, I, I don't uh, know where you're uh, going with uh, this. Well, is, is it's not just confabulation is an actual medical condition. It's not just creating lies, correct? Uh, it uh, can be a, uh, related uh, to uh, a medical condition, yes. Is it often seen in situations where people have had a brain injury? Yes. Okay. So inconsistent testimony by the plaintiff may be attributable to confabulation if his story is to be believed that he has a TBI. So uh, to point that uh, symptom, confabulation, uh, to uh, uh, the brain, uh, uh, alleged uh, brain injury, sure, it's possible, but uh, uh, but plenty of other things could account uh, for a bad symptom of a confabulation. Sure, but it is possible, as you just said, correct? Yes. <clears throat> and from the 2009 to the last scan that you saw, and I don't know when that was, probably the 2017 scan, um, have you seen any of his symptoms, the symptomology that you reviewed earlier, getting progressively worse from an actual imaging standpoint? 
No, um, but uh, we were uh, talking about uh, clinical diagnoses backed up, you know, only backed up uh, by imaging. Yes. Sure. But there's no physical, you can't point to any scans that say this is different than it was in those early scans in 2009. Nor would uh, I necessarily expect to. Do you know what the medical term discordant means? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, we uh, don't uh, often use uh, that. Okay. And what does it mean? Well, it uh, means uh, uh, loosely uh, that. Uh, Things that don't uh, make sense and don't uh, add up. Okay. You've been asked a lot about Mr. Sanderson's medical records and radiology reports that you reviewed. Um, I'm going to show this first page of Plaintiff's Exhibit 6. See this radiology report right here? Yes. Okay. I want to, I'm going to zoom in here for all, for all of us. And Maybe you I've, can move up to avoid the address on the bottom. Sorry about that. Do you want a Sharpie? We'll just go. Do you read that uh, that paragraph that starts the, with the word findings? You see that? Yes. Now, will you just read that first um, sentence for us right there? <coughs> Re -dem a demonstration of a prominent ventricular system discordant with mild cerebral volume loss in solical. Prominent. Now, you have the degrees and I don't. So, does that mean that the prominent ventricular system, the issue with that, that ventricular system that you described earlier, is discordant or not related to or, or different from the mild cerebral volume loss with sulcal prominence? Is that what that means? So, I. I don't uh, I, I don't uh, so suppose how to uh, get uh, into uh, the brain of uh, the neuroradiologist, but uh, but uh, that is a um, valid conclusion. So that's why again that's my layman's approach of, of reading a medical record, and I, I recognize you have that, and I respect your position. But the medical records that you reviewed, discordant is usually used before describing this ventricular issue that you described earlier, isn't that correct? I, I think um, uh, we were uh, talking about uh, two uh, separate uh, things, uh, the uh, enlarged uh, ventricles and uh, as a separate uh, issue, uh, uh, the mild cerebral volume loss. Okay. <clears throat> and short of going well beyond both of our expertise and sounding more like an idiot than I'm sure I already do, I think we'll leave that one there. <clears throat> but you, these aging conditions that you describe, is it also within the possibility of medical certainty that you've offered your opinions that Terry Sanderson's condition could be, in fact, related to post-concussive symptoms. 
That is uh, not uh, what uh, the uh, me medical literature shows, but, but. So uh, I would uh, say much more likely uh, than not. Uh, it is possible, correct. As uh, far as anything is uh, possible, yes. Thank you. Let me just check with co-counsel, and I think that's everything I have for you. <laughs> so if other witnesses uh, reported massive changes directly after this ski crash in 2016, would you also attribute those massive immediate changes to the aging process? Re, uh, restate uh, the question. Sure. If other witnesses, ex-girlfriends and daughters, report massive changes in the plaintiff after the ski crash of 2016, would you also attribute their discussion of those massive changes to regular aging? And this is a, a complex question. Uh, he had distress over uh, very real rib fractures. Uh, he had a psychological and physical symptoms that uh, do influence, you know, a patient's global functioning. Uh, rib fractures heal. Bumps and bruises heal. What uh, we're left with long term, so uh, I, I don't uh, disagree with uh, uh, the, uh, the fact that people around uh, the plaintiffs uh, said that, that uh, there were, were big changes in his physical and psychological psychological function immediately after uh, the injury but uh, uh, there was brain related uh, issues should have resolved within weeks to a few months and what we're left with is um, a 76, well, uh, 69 year old uh, at uh, the, uh, the uh, time brain with multiple problems. Sure. But looking over the medical history that, like you did, you see that Terry Sanderson continued to try to seek treatment for something that was going on that he attributed to be fairly related to this accident, correct? I would uh, say uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, medical attention seeking behavior started um, before and, and uh, evidence uh, uh, by uh, his uh, primary care physician uh, visit uh, uh, the week, uh, the uh, three weeks earlier, and uh, that was uh, likely a ball that was already ruling. So he was interested in his health before the ski crash. You've testified to that, correct? Yes. So he would be very interested in anything that he viewed to, he viewed to be very acutely changed. Isn't that also correct? 
Yes. It will be part of that pattern to continue going to the doctor a lot up until you think that you're going to get some sort of resolution of your symptoms. Isn't that correct? Uh, I don't uh, suppose uh, to uh, know what uh, was uh, going on and how they played it of some money. Okay. Thank you very much, Doctor. I appreciate it. Help from the back here. Last question. What do you perceive to be Terry's life expectancy going forward? I have uh, no um, information uh, to base a opinion on uh, that. Thank you, doctor. Yeah. Mr. Owens. I'm going to read you what you told me your opinions are on redirect or on direct, and then I want you to say, tell me if anything has changed as a result of cross examination. The compelling evidence is that plaintiff's concussion was mild and that he lost consciously, consciousness only momentarily, if at all. Is that still your opinion? Yes. Plaintiff's post collision neuropsychological evaluation shows no evidence of impairment. Is that still your opinion? It is. None of the plaintiff's medical records support his claims that perceived symptoms of cognitive decline are related to the ski collision. You adapt this point, yes. Another way of saying that is all current symptoms are explained by his pre-collision uh, aging and degenerative diseases. Overruled. Much more likely and uh, likely than not. Yes. And you were asked about a a new word. Confabulation, like lying. You were asked about that, right? Yes. Did you review the deposition of Jenny Sanders, Sanderson, the daughter? Yes. Did you observe she said that her dad would, in fact, be dishonest in order to get money? Yes. Objection. Beyond the scope. That's school. not an evidence. No, that's not an evidence. Confab, it is. Overruled. And that he seeks attention and that the notoriety of this case makes him feel powerful. Did you read that? I did. And uh, on our little break, you said it's outrageous. You said something was outrageous that they would assert something. What, do you remember what it was? His current conditions are related to the ski collision. <clears throat> what? Uh, what? Am I throwing you? No, uh, I'm uh, ping, uh, ping. Taking my words very wisely. Thank you. <clears throat> the uh, neuropsych uh, evidence and uh, the uh, psychiatric evidence. Have long evidence uh, to support yeah, that when a 
concussion like uh, this electric uh, concussion last over you know months uh, there is a high concordance rate with uh, the uh, patient being involved in litigation and and also media attention Judge, both beyond the scope of his proper testimony overruled explained the post accident both of which are hyper real in this case hyper real means what what very well uh, real uh, very real what is hyper real I missed it so uh, so uh, it's uh, just a colloquial term uh, for extremely you know so extremely real what is again extremely real now uh, the uh, factors of uh, uh, this litigation and uh, the factors of the media attention around his concussion case. So what of, what of those things is hyper real? What are they doing to him about his current symptomology? Well, so I'm trying to understand this response, Your Honor. O overruled. It goes to the weight. You got it. Dumb it down for me, please. Uh, the fact uh, that uh, this is uh, the first legal case uh, that is ever tele uh, televised in Utah makes it hyper real. In what way to Sander, to Mr. Sanderson? What is that doing to him, those facts? Foundation, Your Honor. I'm just trying to understand his could comment. You, maybe you could go into a little bit more of the background behind this opinion? Yeah, I'm trying to understand the point you're making um, and then what it's based on. So you're saying this very litigation and the media attention is impacting Mr. Sanderson. It, is that your opinion? Overruled as a preface to the question. Yes. Absolutely. Okay, and then how? So uh, the uh, litigation, so uh, a lot of uh, money is in play here. Is that affecting Mr. Sanderson's symptoms? Yeah. Foundation, Your Honor. Yeah. He can't sustain. So I'm being told to sit down. Have a nice day. Mr. Sorensen? Doctor, uh, is hyper real a medical term? No. Okay, so that's has no basis in any sort of medical literature. Uh, I would uh, say extremely real, uh, extremely real relevant. Okay, but again, you never conducted your own psychological evaluation of the plaintiff, correct? No. So that would be pure speculation about his motives or anything like that? Based on a number of uh, studies and meant analysis of uh, uh, case, uh, cases similar to this. So case studies, but nothing directly attributable or applicable to Dr. Sanders? Case studies. Uh, so uh, meta analysis of uh, actual um, 
uh, things that are in the medical literature. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, you may step down. Thank you. You ready for your next witness, or should we take our last break? Your Honor, uh, definitely let's take our last break. Okay, we'll take a short recess. Short recess, thank you. I can see that.
you like me to go get them, Your Honor? Yes. Or is, is, okay. Yes, please. Back. Thank you. Are we on the record? Yes, we are. Okay, we're back on the record. Uh, council are present and parties are present. Mr. Thank Owens? You. Yes, thanks. So we're thinking this uh, Kerry Oaks is going to go about a half hour, and then we're trying to figure out how to best use that other half hour. Sure. Uh, one option is, so, well, here's the question. How strictly, we now have essentially one full day of evidence left, how strictly are you keeping us to, like, four hours each left? Strict. Strict. So when you run out of time, you're done. Okay, so... Um, and I'm trying to be mindful of the jury. So depending how much time is left, then we'll call Terry Sanders back to the stage, uh, back to the uh, pulpit. We talking tomorrow? No. If we have time before oh, tonight. five. Okay. Okay. Thanks. All right. Ready for the jury. I assume that you'll explain to the jury what we're doing. I will. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to go ahead and take your seat? Yes. Okay. Sure. Um, do you want, do you, do, do you swear me in? That you'll read? <laughs> no, I think not. The, the lawyers will point out any errors in your reading. I'm sure it's better than swearing at you. What page are we starting on? So, um, we are starting. The funny thing. Okay. Okay. Right. Thank you. And who's doing the questioning, Ms. Abarama? Okay. Thank you. You may be wondering why, why Ms. Van Orman is seated as a witness. Um, the, we are now going to read a deposition, old school style. So the, the witness name is Terry Oaks. Terry. K-E-R-I. Thank you for that correction. It's listed two ways in here. Kerry Oaks and the person that will be reading uh, Kerry Oaks part is Ms. Kristen Van Orman and the questioner will be Ms. Abarama. You may proceed, starting on page six. Judge, would you like me to state the page number and the line number? I think if you, right now, just uh, whenever you skip areas, tell me where you're going. Okay, and probably just but the page. You... Don't need to do the lines. We'll yeah. Do. All right, starting on page six. Good morning, Ms. Oaks. Could you spell your name for the record? Yes, it's K-E-R-I, and Oaks is O-A-K-S. And do you know about what year you started working at Deer Valley? 
It's page 12, Your Honor. <clears throat> 1990, actually, that was a couple, yeah, about that area, give or take a couple of years. Page 16. Okay, when we talk about the incident or the ski collision or the ski crash or similar words, let's just agree right now that we're talking about the incident that occurred on February 26, 2016, involving Gwyneth Paltrow and my client, Terry Sanderson. Is that clear? Yes. Okay, now I would like to go through some of the parties to this case. Do you know my client, Terry Sanderson? Not beyond seeing him on the hill that day. Okay, have you had any other contact with him prior to that or subsequent? Where I spoke with him or no. Okay, what about Gwyneth Paltrow? How long have you, or before this incident, do you know Gwyneth Paltrow? That may have been the first time that I skied with her family. I don't recall exactly how many days I skied with them. Page 18. Okay, one or two ski trips you've skied with Gwyneth Paltrow, correct? Correct. Sorry, if you could speak up. Correct. Okay, what about Brad Falchuk? Do you know who he is? Yes. Did you ski with him on the ski trip that involved this ski crash? In what capacity? I mean, did you meet him? Yes, we met him. Okay, and I understand you were teaching primarily one of the children with some of the children. Is that correct? Not his children. Okay, whose children were you teaching? Gwyneth's. And who are they? Apple is specifically who I was with. Okay, and were all of the ski trips with Brad Falchuk and Miss Paltrow's children, they were all on the trips with Gwyneth Paltrow, correct? Correct. You didn't ski with Brad Falchuk or the children on the trips where Miss Paltrow was not there, correct? Correct. Did you know who Greg Ramon is? No. Do you know who Eric Christensen is? Yes. How do you know Eric? Through Deer Valley. We work together. How long have you known Eric? Since, I don't know the exact amount of years, but most of the time that I've been an employee here, I've known him. Page 31. What did you discuss on the day of the collision with Eric Christensen? In, in particular? What, what in particular? Anything about the collision with Miss Paltrow and my client, Terry Sanderson. A relief that everybody was safe. And who was everybody? Everybody, meaning both people who collided. Miss Paltrow and Mr. Sanderson? Yes. Page 53. So just before the ski collision, please describe what was happening. Had you all met at the top of Flagstaff Mountain, for example? Yes, we were. We got off the chairlift, decided that we were going to go down to lunch, and... Can I interrupt? When you say we got off the chairlift, who is we again, just so we're clear? The we would have been Gwyneth, Apple, and I were on the chairlift. I believe that Eric was with Moses. Then we met up with Brad, and I cannot remember exactly where, the, where his kids and their instructors were, they may have been down already, having the table for lunch, so we decided to go ski down Bandana to the Empire Lodge for lunch. Then as we started skiing down Bandana, it was not crowded at all. There was really nobody on the run. And Moses and Apple wanted their mom to watch them, you know, wanted to do the, si the, the side of the run, and she could see. She could see them ski. So we stopped to cross the run. The run was clear. There was nobody in front. It was... It stands out in my mind because that's a rarity. Bandana was fairly, it was empty where we were, and so we had just crossed the run. And as I, I mean, as I looked before we crossed the run uphill, there was, it was fairly, there was really no one in sight, except farther up by a slow sign from where we were. And we crossed, made two turns, and then I heard the sound and looked over, and that's when I saw that they had collided and we were both on the snow. What was the sound you heard? Just I heard her voice, and that's what caught my attention. So I want to just go back over this slowly. No, can you just go to 56? Can you go back? Oh, sorry. Back starting on one and read again. You inserted a word at, uh, inadvertently. I apologize. I heard the sound. Then I heard the sound and looked over, and that's when saw 
that they had collided and were both on the snow. Go, go ahead and just read the rest of the page, that's fine. And what was the sound you heard? Just I heard her voice and that's what caught my attention. So I just want to just go back over this slowly. You started skiing down Bandana without Apple and Moses, correct? Still on 55. Okay. You want to ask that one more time? Sure. So I want to just go back over this slowly. You started skiing down Bandana without Apple and Moses, correct? And Gwyneth and Eric, correct. And you said you crossed the run. Was that near the top of the run? Near the top of the run. When you say you crossed the run, does that mean you went skiers left? Yes, we were on skiers right, and then we had slowed down, or actually, I believe we might have even stopped enough that we were in a group. And then I looked uphill before we crossed, just to make sure it was safe, and then the kids and Eric and I crossed the run. To the left? To the left, to skiers left. And were Eric and you above Apple and Moses when you did this? I was, he was behind. He was above hill, and I was more to the side, and a little above hill. And then what happened after you started crossing to the left? We crossed to the left and started skiing down the side, and then we heard after, as I said, two, maybe three times, heard the sound of, it was more Gwyneth sounded surprised. It was like a surprise sound, and you know, we looked over, and they were both on the ground. When you started to cross to the left, did Miss Paltrow then st go straight down to the right? Is that what she did? She stayed on the right, but she did not go straight. Were you able to see her while you were watching Apple and Moses? Yes, I was able to see her. How was she skiing? She skis small, radius turns, consistent speed. At this point in time, it was slow because she wanted to be able to see the kids. They were not skiing fast because the kids are not fast. Was she then going to stop and look up or was she going to look to the left, do you know? She was not going to stop because we were skiing. Okay. Is it your understanding Miss Paltrow was going to look to the left while she was skiing to her children skiing? No, I cannot say what she was going to do. She was, they were in her sight and we were all, the goal was to ski down to the lodge for lunch. When did the topic of Miss Paltrow watching her children come up? It, yeah, watching her children ski. Excuse me. When did the topic of Miss Paltrow watching her children ski come up? It was, Mommy, watch me, and we want to go ski this, and she, and so we, we took them to the side. It wasn't a detailed plan on how she was going to watch. It was just a plan to ski down to the lodge. Okay, and when Eric, Moses, Apple, and you started skiing to the left, was Miss Paltrow skiing on the right? Correct. She was skiing on the right. Page 68. Was Miss Paltrow agitated? She went up because she was very surprised and shocked because that was her comment was that that he hit her. What was her comment? Her comment was that she was hit and was frustrated, but then as she got up and she then she checked on him. He checked on her. Everybody was quite calm. Nobody was agitated or yelling. When did she ski off, Miss Paltrow? I don't recall exactly. I believe she was there for most of the time, and yeah, she was there for most of the time. I think that when we had the verbal, when it was verbalized that everybody was okay, Mr. Sanderson verbalized to us that he was okay, he was fine, and that was his response to her checking. We checked, ski patrol checked. And so then at that point in time, you know, that's when she just, we said, okay, let's start. We can start dispersing because everyone expressed and we were acting as if they were just fine. It was just a collision, no harm, no foul. And earlier you mentioned that Mr. Sanderson got up. Do you recall anyone helping him get up? We were there, both Eric and I were there to help him. I don't recall that he, he didn't need us to lift him off the snow. I don't recall needing to give much assistance, but we were there for both parties to help them both and make sure they were both okay to our abilities and then assess him. From then, we would assess if there was the need for ski patrol to be called, but they happened to ski by and check themselves. Page 71. 
And why didn't you write an incident report that day? I, because nobody, to our knowledge, nobody was hurt. Everybody left the scene on their own volition and their own, everybody was able to leave. And it was, again, like just any other incident where people, you know, got tangled up and everybody was okay and everybody left. And so, page 82. Did Gwyneth Paltrow say she didn't see Terry Sanderson before the collision? She did not use that. I mean, he wasn't in front of her, so she, he was not in front of her, but she didn't use that phrase. She said, he hit me. You're assuming she was in front of him, correct? I saw that there was nobody in front of her when we were skiing, and so that, that's not an assumption. I, there was nobody on the hill with us in our immediate vicinity. Page 106. Miss Oaks, just before the collision, Gwyneth Paltrow's children, Moses and Apple, wanted her to watch them skiing, correct? Yes, we were skiing together down the final run down to lunch. Miss Paltrow was skiing down to the right, looking up at her children to see them skiing, correct? She was skiing down on the right side. Her children were in her periphery. Can you remind me one more time to what page we're on? Sure, now we're on page 107, starting on line 14. So she was looking over at the kids to see them ski. I can't say exactly where she was looking. They were in her periphery. She could see them while looking ahead to ski. So Miss Paltrow was distracted, looking at her children while she was skiing just before the collision. I would not say, well, I can't say that she was distracted. Was Miss Paltrow looking at her kids while she was skiing down Bandana Run? When I saw her, she was looking ahead at the run in front of her. Was she also looking at her children skiing? I did not see her looking at her children. So Miss Paltrow was distracted when the collision occurred, looking at her children, correct? She's not looking at her children when I saw her. She was looking ahead, skiing down. So she wasn't watching her children. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I didn't, they, they were in her periphery. I don't know what she was looking at directly. I don't know that she was looking at them directly. She was looking ahead where she was skiing when I saw her. At the moment of the collision though, you had not seen her for three to five seconds, correct? Probably three to five seconds. So you don't know where she was looking other than she was supposed to be looking at her children, right? I don't know exactly where, that she was looking directly at them. I do know that when parents ski with their kids, it doesn't mean their eyes are glued on their kids. They can glance at them. They can see them in their periphery. And as long as the kids know the parents are there and they're in their visual, that's what the kids want. I don't know exactly what she was doing. The children were satisfied. Moses and Apple wanted their mother, Gwyneth Paltrow, to watch them ski down Bandana, correct? That's what they had said. Watch us ski this, Mom. Okay, that was the conversation. Page 111. Okay, and then maybe you already answered this, but in that when you last saw Miss Paltrow, the three to five seconds before the scream, did you observe whether there was anyone below her on the ski hill? I observed that the area in the front of her was empty. I think that's it. 111. That's it. Okay. Thank you. May I be excused, John? You may. Thank you. That's not good for recall, right? Right. Mr. Owens, you may call your next witness. Thanks, Your Honor. Um, could we have a quick, quick bench conference here? Yes.
Okay. Um, the parties have stipulated a fact, and, and it looks like it will save us some time. Um, Mr. Brad Falchuk, who may or may not testify later, depending on how much time there is left in the case, uh, the parties have stipulated that he would testify were he, were, were he to be called as a witness that he did not see the accident. Is that correct from the plaintiffs? Yes. yes. From the defense? Did the, did the court correctly? Uh, I believe so. Okay. Um, he may or may not be called if there is time. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And, you're, and, and so we'll now move to the defendants have a deposition to read. Yes. We're going to try to get to the two kids' depositions. Okay. First. Are we reading the entire deposition or marked parts? No, the marked version. Moses. <laughs> So we're going to have a, we're calling Peter as a fake Moses to the stand. Okay. Steve, so Peter will read do Moses. Do I have a marked copy? I don't think I have a marked copy. And I'd like the lawyers to each read their side of the questioning so that we can capture the minutes used by each side. I just need to get my copies back that I gave to them. What if we, uh, because we don't have two marked copies because we're doing this on the fly, what if we have, uh, we'll read out uh, Moses all the marked part, and you read um, Apple all the marked part. That's fine. Let's do this. That's right. That's right. They're, they're not. You know what? You better better keep it. Yeah. Just in case. Okay. This is kind of weird, but I'm the questioner and you're Moses. Correct. Do you recall how old you are at the time? You need to, you need to start tell us what page is up, please. Thank you, page seven. Let's just make sure that's where we're starting. Yes, page seven. Line 22. Do you recall how old you are, you are, were at the time? Nine. Okay, I'm turning the page. back up because there's some gray. Could you just spell your name for the record? Protected identity. Okay, so we we all stipulate this was is Moses Martin. Yes. I'm on page seven. As you know, we're talking about this ski collision that occurred about four and a half years ago. Are you familiar with that? Yes. And I'm gonna pick up where I was. Do you recall how old you were at the time? Nine. Okay, and you recall this ski trip in February of 2016, correct? Yes. About four and a half years ago, correct? Yes. Okay, you recall skiing that morning that your mother was involved in this ski collision, correct? Yes. I'm now turning the page to page nine at the bottom. Okay. When this ski collision occurred, do you recall where you were at the moment the ski collision occurred? I do not recall where I was at the moment it occurred. Did you see the ski collision? I did not see the actual collision. Okay, so let's just start maybe at the beginning of the run. You got off a chairlift, correct? Yes. And the run is called Bandana. Are you familiar with the Bandana run? Yes. Okay, at the time of the collision, 
did you or just before the collision occurred you were skiing from the top is that correct yes and who were you skiing with from what I recall my instructor Eric page 11 page 11 line 22 and you were skiing with Eric as your ski instructor just before the collision correct yes and do you recall who else was skiing with you at that time? No. Was your sister AM, meaning Apple, nearby? Yes. Do you know where she was in relation to you on the hill? No. Could she have been below you? Yes. You don't recall seeing your sister? Not exactly, no. Tell us what happened on the bandana run just before the collision. What do you recall? I recall skiing with my instructor and briefly seeing the collision. Um, and then he skied over and I followed him. And I saw my mother and a person behind her um, that he had crashed. Who had crashed? Okay, did you hear a noise before the collision? No. And the person behind her, was that a man? Yes. Moving to the top of page 13, was this person uphill from your mother? Yes. How close were they, your mother and this other man? As I recall, decently close. Let's just say, you know, this close, you know, see my hands, they're about a foot, about 14 inches apart, or were they further apart? I think something like that, but I'm not 100% sure. Were they touching each other? I do not remember. Was your mother, was her head above her skis, so her head was uphill and her skis were downhill? Yes. And the man that was nearby her, were his head in where was her his head in relation to hers or to his body? Was his head uphill or downhill? Uphill. So I'm just going to go back a little bit. So when did you first realize your mom was involved in a collision? How did you realize that? I realized the equipment that she was wearing because I know that she wears what she wears when she skis. And then I realized, realized that it was my mom. So I was standing around, I realized that it was my mother. And did you hear a noise that told you there was something going on, a commotion or anything? When I skied over, I heard my mom yelling at the guy. What was she saying? She was saying something along the lines of, what the F word, you just ran into me. And anything else that you recall at that moment? No. Was she standing up when she said that? I do not fully remember, but I believe she was on the ground lying down. Okay, did she get up by herself? I do not remember. I'm just going to go back in slow motion to let's say three seconds before this collision occurred, you were skiing with Eric. If you're facing downward, skier's left is on the left side, and skier's right is on the right side. Do you know which side you were on the hill just before this collision occurred? I was on the left side. Do you know how far on the left you were? No. Do you think that... But farish. Okay. Were you closer to the left edge of the ski hill? I believe so, yes. And do you recall anyone else on the hill at that moment? I do not remember. Were there other skiers on the hill? Yes. About how many? I'm not sure. And so what made you ski over to your mother? Was it, did someone tell you? I, I was following my instructor, but I did not know what was going on. So you, fall, you followed your instructor over to where your mother and this ma other man were lying down, correct? Yes. That scene, you know, your mother and this man laying down, what else, what else do you recall? Um, I recall skiing over, seeing a few people around them. I remember my instructor um, seeing what was happening. And then I remember my mom on the ground downhill of, of the man that was uphill from her. And I recall that they were both on the ground at the time that I skied over. About how far away do you think they were? I do not recall. About a, a foot, maybe? I'm asking how far apart your mother and the man were when you skied over there. 
I'd say a foot, maybe more. Were they touching? I do not remember. And do you remember your mother getting up? Yes, but not for a while. Okay, how long was a while? Like, you know, five or ten seconds? I'd say two minutes, maybe. And how did she get up? I do not remember. Did she get up by herself? I do not remember. Did someone help her? I do not remember. Do you recall a large man next to the ski collision location? I do not remember. You said there were some other people there. What do you remember? I remember seeing a few people. Not a lot, but maybe three people. Not in, including my instructor. So there was your mother, the man that was involved in the collision, and then there was your instructor. Were there any other people? I believe so. How many other people do you think? I do not recall. Like, was there one or two or three or four maybe? I do not recall. And then what did you do after you skied down to your mother? I stood there wondering what was going on, and then I believe that afterwards we went to eat lunch. I remember it. And who is we? Um, as I remember, it was being me and my instructor, and I'm not sure whether my mother came down afterwards or with us. So you skied down with your instructor to the bottom? Yes. Of the hill? To lunch. So you skied down the hill with your instructor, Eric Christensen? Yes. Anyone else ski down with you? I do not remember. Just before the collision, your sister was somewhere in the area skiing with you? I believe so. Anyone else in the area? I don't remember. Do you recall Apple, Apple's ski instructor? No. Do you recall her being present, the ski instructor for Apple? I don't remember. Do you remember Apple's ski instructor's name being Carrie Oaks? Carrie? Uh, I believe so. So was anything said when you came down to the collision site where your mother and this man were? My mother said to the guy, what the F word, you just ran into me. And then anything else that you recall? Not that I recall. Were people talking? I believe so. Was the man talking? I do not remember. When I say the man, I mean the man that was involved on the ground or the snow next to your mother. I think it should be on the snow next to your mother, correct? What do you... When I say the man next to your mother, the person that was involved in the ski collision. Yes. So that's... I do not. I do not remember if he was talking or not. Okay. Do you remember if your ski instructor, Eric Christensen, was talking? I do. I don't have a closer memory on that. No. Did anyone besides your mother say that they had seen the collision? I do not remember. I do not remember. Do you remember talking about the s ski collision at the bottom of the hill? Vaguely. What do you recall? My mother saying that she got hit or ran into. You said you went to lunch afterwards, correct? Yes. Did you discuss the ski collision at lunch? I believe so. What do you rec recall? Not much. Who was at lunch with you after the ski collision? Oh, the only people that I remember are my sister, my instructor, and my mother. Since the day of the collision, have you <laughs> talked about the ski collision with anyone? Anyone else you've talked to about the ski collision? I don't remember. Do you think you might have talked about it with some other people? I don't remember. I'm now on page 25. When you skied down to the collision site before you left, did you notice any ski patrol or medical pe people come by? I do not recall. Do you recall any other people in green uniforms at the collision site besides your ski instructor? I do not remember. Before the ski collision, do you recall saying something to the effect of, hey, watch me ski? No. Have you ever said something like that? No. After the collision, this is bottom of page 26, after the collision, when you were watching your mom and this man on the ground, did Eric appear angry at all? Not at all. Was he yelling, raising his voice, shouting, anything along those lines? No, not at all. 
Why are you so sure? It seems like your memory's a little faded in some areas, which is okay and understandable. But I want to know why you're so sure about this. Because I remember him addressing the situation very calmly. How so? What stands out to you? He tried to find out what was going on and try and see how he could help everyone. Without, I was tried, he tried to help everybody get out of the situation safely and yes. Do you remember anything specifically he said? Not specifically. I think plaintiff's counsel, Lawrence, asked you some questions about, they were sort of vague about what have you seen? Said, hey, watch me ski. Maybe a better way to put this question. Have you ever told your mom, hey, mom, watch this, before you decide to do something on your skis, if you'd like her to watch you ski? I do not recall saying things along the lines of that. Did Eric help your mother stand up? I do not remember. Do you remember Eric helping up the man that was involved in the collision? I do not remember. Do you remember skiing down with Eric after you left the ski site? I don't know if it was exactly Eric, but I did ski down alone. I did not ski down alone. Okay, how close, close were you to Eric as you skied down towards your mother when you realized there was some commotion or incident? Close. I, I skied closely to him. And then you stopped near your mother? Yes. And then how long after you stopped did you ski down? Was it like a minute or two? I do not exactly remember. My best guess would be somewhere along the lines of two or three minutes. So you were standing there about two or three minutes, you think? I think so. That completes the questioning, Your Honor. Thank you. You may call your next witness. Uh, do you want to play Apple and you ask a question? They're going to read another deposition of Apple. Is that okay with you guys if they just do it? Yeah. Just let us know the pages because remember, I don't have a fully marked copy. Thank you. Can you just spell your name for the record, please? Page, oh, sorry. Page 11, line 13. Protected identity. And your last name? Protected identity. OK, you understand that this is a lawsuit involving a ski collision at Deer Valley in, on February 2000, February 26, 2016. Are you aware? Yes. Uh, microphone more toward the center of the two of you. Thank you. Sure. Okay, page 12, line 3. Okay, and do you recall this event back in February 26, 2016? Yes. Okay, how old were you back in 2016? Were you? 11. No, 12. About 11 or 12? Yeah, yes. Okay, what were your skiing, ab what was your skiing ability at the time? Intermediate, beginner. Okay. Somewhere in between. About how many times have you skied approximately for this date in February of 2016? Four times. Page 15, line 10. Okay, and do you remember your ski instructors on that trip? Yes, we had Carrie, Preston, and then my brother's instructor, who I can't remember the name of, and one more female instructor that I also cannot remember the name of. Page 16, line 7. Okay, that morning, do you remember skiing with which instructor? Carrie. Okay, and your brother was skiing with another male instructor, I think you said, correct? Yes. I'll just represent to you that his name is probably Eric Christian Christensen. Does that refresh your memory? Yes. 17, first line. Okay, so do you recall that the morning of February 26, 2016, when you were skiing with Eric and Apple, or in Moses, and... Yes. Carrie, where had, where had you been skiing that morning before the incident with my client? We were on the mountain Carrie. at the hotel, and 
that we were at. It was a ski in, ski out type of thing. We were mainly on the greens and blues. Do you know about how many runs you had skied before the incident? Five or six, I'd say. And were you skiing with Carrie that whole time? Yes. Was your mother skiing with you at the same time? Yes. Did your mother ever ski different runs when you were skiing with Carrie? I don't remember. Okay, your brother Moses, about what level is he as, is he as a skier? Beginner. Okay, now I'd like to go to the bottom before the ski collision that's subject of this case, okay? Okay. So you were at the top of the ski hill, and I believe the run is Bandana. Do you recall the name of the run? Yes, it was Bandana. And why do you know it was named Bandana? It was our favorite run. Page 19. And you remembered the ski run because it's your favorite run, correct? It was, yes. And it was also the run you go down to the hotel you were staying at? Yes. Okay, next I'm going to ask you what you recall happening on that run, but before, do you recall the ski, the ski collision? I did not see it, but I recall the events following it. Okay, well what was going on during the time just before, just before the ski collision? We were on our way to lunch at the lodge. And who were you with? I was with my instructor, my brother, my stepfather, my mother, my step-siblings, and their instructors. But we were all a bit scattered on the run, so some of us were in front, others were trailing behind a bit more. And who was with your group? I was ahead with my instructor, my stepsister, and her instructor. Was Brad Falchuk with you? No. Sorry, that's page 20. So, just to clarify, at the time of the collision, there was you, Carrie Oakes, your ski instructor, there was uh, IF, and then there was IF's instructor, who we don't know whose name yet, and then there was also your brother's instructor, Eric Christensen, and then there was your brother, Moses, correct? Yes, but I was not with Moses and Eric. They were a little up the run. I was all, I was closer to the lodge at the time. 21. About how far away were you from your brother Moses, as you recall, before, just before the collision? I would say I was, I don't really know how to say it. I was further down the run. They were in the middle of the run. I was towards the end with my stepsister. I was not with Moses or my mother. And did you know when the collision occurred? Not the exact time, no. Did you hear something before the collision? I don't remember. Did you hear a scream? I did hear some commotion, but I was further down, so I decided to continue to go down to the lodge. Okay, so when you heard the commotion, is that what you think is the collision? Yes. And when you heard that commotion, did you look anywhere? I don't remember. Did you see your mother after you heard the commotion? Again, I don't remember. So I'd like to know just the, cu just the couple seconds before the collision, and then the couple of seconds after the collision. So only about five seconds of time, so you heard in so you heard something, a commotion, right? Yes. And then you did, and then did you see anything? I don't recall if I had seen anything or not. I think that I did, but I don't remember. Okay. And when you heard that commotion, you're with Carrie Oaks, your ski instructor, right? Yes. And where was she in relation to you? Was she above you or below you? I believe she would have been in front of me. That is usually how we skied. She would lead me. We're on 23 now. Okay, so the five seconds around the commotion that you believe was the collision, you were with Carrie Oaks and IF, and then the three seconds afterwards, what did you do at that point? We continued to ski down to lunch. And did you know at that time that there was a ski collision? No. When did you first learn that there was a ski collision? When my mom had arrived at lunch after we had gotten there, about five minutes after. And how did you learn about the ski collision? My mom told me. She... She was very, she told us what happened. What did she say? She said, she came in and she immediately, I noticed that she looked a bit shocked and I asked what had happened and she said, this a-hole ran into me. He ran right into my back. And I remember she did this motion saying that he ran into her back and they both went down. Um, but I, I remembered that's what she said. 24. So let's go back to the moment of the collision or the commotion. You heard, you heard the commotion. You didn't see the collision, but you continued to ski down. Did yes. Did Carrie Oak ski with you? I believe so. Yes. And she skied with you down to the bottom. Down to where we were eating. Yes. 
Okay, and when I say the bottom, I mean the bottom of Bandana Run, which is where the lodges and uh, yes. eating places are. Is that clear? Yes. And so after, right after the commotion, Carrie Oaks, IF, and you ski down to the bottom of the Bandana Run, correct? Yes. And who is at the bottom of the run when you got there? I don't remember. I just know that we were meeting everybody to eat. Okay. At the, I'm sorry to keep going back to the commotion. Did you see anyone else on the ski run at the time of the commotion? Well, there were other people skiing, but again, I don't really, I didn't really pay attention to what had happened. I just heard um, some sort of screaming going on above me, but I continued to ski down, and I don't remember if I turned around or not. Okay. Did you recognize the screaming? Whose voice, wa whose voice was it? It sounded like a woman, but we were so far down, I didn't, I couldn't really put anything to it. It wasn't very clear. Okay. How soon after you got to the bottom did your mother arrive? I would say five to ten minutes. So you were waiting for her at the bottom? Yes. And what about Brad Falchuk? Was he with your mother when he arrived at the bottom? I believe so. Did he arrive sooner than she did? I don't remember. Well, I'd like to go back to the commotion and just let you continue and tell, and tell us, to the best of your memory, what happened. So you, heard the, so you heard the commotion, and then what happened? And then we continued to ski down, and we got to where we were eating lunch. We started to take off our gear and then sat down. And then shortly after, my mother, Brad Falchuk, my brother, I can't remember if my br stepbrother was there or not, but everybody else followed in after I had arrived. And who is everybody else? To the best of my ability, I'm pretty sure it would have been my mother, my little brother Moses, Brad Falchuk, I would say one or two more instruct instructors, and my stepbrother, B.F. Okay, do you recall which ski instructors were there? Again, I remember um, Carrie, my instructor, Preston, who skied with B.F. and I.F., Eric, and I believe that there was one more um, female instructor, but I can't fully recall. Okay, do you recall anyone else uh, be besides the people you've mentioned at the side of the commotion? No. We're on 27. So when you're at the having lunch, was the ski collision discussed at lunch? Yes. And what do you recall about the, that discussion? My mom was explaining what had happened, saying that a man ran into her back and they both went down. And she was in a state of shock. And she decided after that she was not going to ski for the rest of the day, which she never does. She always stays on. But she decided to get off because she was in shock and she was in a bit of pain. Did Carrie Oak say anything? I believe there was a conversation between them. I don't recall what it was about, but it was probably about my mom getting off the mountain. Okay, do you recall anything else? I recall getting back onto the mountain for a couple more runs, and then I got off the mountain, and I think that my mom was getting a massage. Okay, when you got back on the mountain after lunch, who were you skiing with? I was skiing with Carrie. Anyone else? Um, I don't remember. Maybe my stepsister. Do you recall skiing with M.M.? I Moses? don't. I don't remember. Okay. Were you concerned about your mother at the time? Yes. What was your concern? Well, she... I never see her really, like, shaken up like that. And she was very clearly visibly upset. And she had some sort of pain. I can't remember what, but she was in a little bit of pain. And I remember that's why she went to the spa to get a massage. Did you discuss the ski collision with anyone after you left lunch? I think that my step-siblings and my brother and I, we talked about it because my brother was closer to the collision, and he had also said that he skied into her back, and they, like, both went down together. This is Moses. Can you tell us more specifically what Moses said? Well, Moses was, Moses was kind of telling us what had happened. I don't know if he for sure saw it, but I know that he was with people that saw it, and so they had told him what had happened and that it was what he said. He said that my mom got hit in the back. Oh, what did he say again? He said that my mom got hit in the back and their leg, like she went, they both went down together after somebody had skied into her, into her back. We are on 30. Okay, when you finished skiing, did you discuss the ski collision? Yes. With whom? I believe we talked about it at dinner and after. Just I was checking in with my mom to make sure that she was okay. And what did you discuss? 
I asked her how she was doing, how she was feeling. She said she was in pain. Again, I don't remember where exactly, but she did say that she was in pain. She had gotten a massage, I believe. So this was around dinner time, and we had just kind of gone over what had happened. Did she say anything about my client, Terry Sanderson? She had earlier in the day, immediately, not immediately after, but after five minutes, after we all met at lunch, she said that um, he had skied into her back, and she called him an a-hole who had skied into her back. Anything else you can recall? I remember she was very frantic about it, so she probably said something along the lines of that, but that would be all that I remember to the best of my ability. 31. Okay, when you discussed it with your mother and you said she was frantic, what do you mean by that? She was in a state of shock. She was just, she was very upset and she was in pain. Since that collision, had you, have you seen your mother in that state of shock like that since that? Not, no, not like that. So you, under, so you discussed the ski collision that night at dinner and do you recall you were staying at a, a hotel suite or something? Yes, we were in a hotel. The next day, do you recall what you did? I believe we skied in the morning. I can't remember if we had left that day or not. I, the next day, I don't, I don't really remember much. 33. And do you recall how many ski instructors were with you at the time of the collision when you started skiing again? I believe either three or four. And one was Carrie? Yes. And yeah. one was Eric Christensen? Yes. Was another one... Preston? Yes. Was there anyone else you, that you recall? I believe that there was one more person, but I, I can't be too sure about that. Okay. Did anyone tell you they had seen the collision? I don't think so, no. Other than your mother? No. 35. Okay, earlier, earlier I think that you said Moses and said other people had definitely seen the collision. Do you recall saying something like that? I don't think that I said... I don't think that I said that. What do you recall Moses saying? I remember him sort of telling what happened. I don't know that he was, I don't know if he saw it or not, like saw the actual collision, but I know that he saw my mom on the floor. Um, I believe I said that he saw my, let's see, oh, that's you. Um, I believe I said that he saw my mom on the floor, but I don't think that he saw the actual collision. Okay, so after the commotion or collision, you, you skied down to the bottom of Bandana Run, correct? Yes, but again, I, I personally didn't see the collision. Okay, but you heard this commotion? Yes. Did someone say to you, ski down to the bottom after the, of the hill after the commotion? No, we did not think anything of it. We continued to ski down. I don't even know if we stopped. The we included, includes Carrie Oaks? Yes. Did anyone ask you to wait by the side of the hill after the commotion? No. I don't remember that we... I don't... I don't know. That you recall? Do you recall seeing anyone going to, to help your mother after the commotion? I, again, did not see the aftermath. I had continued to ski down, but I believe that people did help her. And what makes you believe that? Because I assume that she would have needed help up, and she was close to her boyfriend, Brad, who is now her husband at the time, and both my brother's ski instructors and I believe BF ski instructor. So I'm assuming that they would have helped her. But Carrie Oak stayed with you down to the bottom of the, skied with you, stayed with you down the, the bottom of the hill? Yes. What about Eric Christensen? Do you recall what he was doing after the? I believe that he was with my brother, who was near my mom. So he was near the collision. Okay, and do you recall which side of the hill you were on? Let's talk about skiers left and right. That means that if you were skiing downhill, the left would be the skier facing downhill to their left, and the same on the right. Do you, do you know which side of the hill you were on ski? I don't, I don't remember. Okay, do you think you might have been in the middle of the hill, or the side, or the near the edge of the run bandana? I don't remember. 39. Can you be sure exactly that Carrie Oaks didn't stop and help your mom after the collision, or do you remember that at all? I don't remember. I'm, I think that we were further down because I know that we got to lunch first, so I don't, I don't remember. Okay. I don't think so. 
Do you recall before the commotion on Bandana Run saying something to the effect of, hey, watch us ski down the hill? No. Do you recall if Moses said something like that? No. Do you recall if any of your other people in your group, like IF or BF, say something like that? I don't know. Okay, I'm just going to show you something here real quick. Do you recognize the person on the left there? That's Carrie. That's that's Carrie Oaks? Yes. 42. So Carrie Oaks was recently deposed, Apple, and she actually has specific memories of being on the scene of the collision. Would you defer to her testimony of specific memories rather than sort of your vague memory that she has with you? Yes, I could have easily been with another instructor. I believe IF had an instructor. Lawrence, I think we have a picture of Eric. Can he... Which has a picture of him on the cover of it. He looks a little older than he did. Oh, he's... Isn't he the one... Oh my god, I remember him so well. He was the best. Oh my god, he was the best. He just... He would give us can candies, and he would tell us. Yes, that's Eric. Would you say he was under 50 years old? I don't remember. I never really skied with him, so I never really saw his face. That's the end of it, Judge. Thank you. Yeah. Your Honor, both Moses and Apple were ready, willing, and able to testify in person on Monday morning. But the objection. Okay. Yeah, well, we address so that after I excuse the jury. Okay. We're going to. I'm going to excuse you now until tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. I will recess. Please do not discuss this case with anyone, including other jurors. Please do not attempt to learn anything about the case outside of the courtroom, including from other jurors. Please avoid radio, TV, internet, uh, and newspaper reports on this case. Please keep an open mind throughout the presentation of the evidence. And finally, please do not form or express an opinion on the case until such time as it is finally submitted to you for deliberations. Have a good evening. Okay, Mr. Owens, what was it that you wanted to put on the record? I would always prefer live testimony to reading transcripts, but uh, the kids were not available. And uh, mostly I just want to put that on the record. I was expecting to take over the case on Monday morning, uh, given multiple assurances that I could do so, and I was not able to do so. The multiple assurances were if we're done, and we intend to be done. It sounds like some kind of a, a statement that we didn't do something we're supposed to do. And they took almost as much time cross-examining more on some of these witnesses, and that's why we didn't finish, <coughs> in my humble opinion. Yeah, you could, you could have called them live. You still can call them live. Um, but I understand that you wanted to put that on the record, so they thank you. unavailable. Thank All right. Um, so we're going to take a short recess, maybe five minutes, and come back and work on jury instructions. Is that right? Okay. Just take a quick bathroom break, and we'll be right back. And hopefully, we'll wrap it up by the end, by half past the hour. Nine. What time would you like everybody here? Um, 8.45, be ready to go, because once all, right. all the jurors are assembled, we can start. Perfect.